powered by Riverside FM. On this episode of Bullet Time, we're in 00 Heaven with Eurocom's 2012 shooter, 007 Legends. Um, I guess what we're talking about films then, uh, because obviously the game that we're talking about today is very, well, it is related to a famous film franchise. I might as well get the three big questions out of the way, which obviously you can have time to think about it. But, Sam, I want to know, who's your favourite Bond? What's your favourite Bond film? And then what's your favourite Bond game? Okay. Favourite Bond is a toss-up between Pierce Brosnan, who was basically Bond when I was first watching Bond. Um, And then going back, I've watched Scattered. I have tried to make a conscious effort to watch them all, and I got through all of Connery, a few more in. But other than that, it has been very scattered, but it's largely been the Roger Moore ones that I've liked. Interesting. Yeah. What do you think it is about more? Like, it's just that they're a little bit lighter. Well, I guess it's kind of, it's sort of in the Brosnan, so the, the kind of the early moors that still bring coming off of uh, what Connery was doing. So they're still relatively grounded. But then after like Moonraker, it's a bit like, eh, actually, we can turn the silly dialogue a little bit more. But it does that. Um, it's a little bit more bombastic at times, but also he looks a lot like my Uncle Keith. <laughs> that's a that's that's a good appeal for a uh, uh, for, for for a bond, I suppose. Um, so films wise, like, does that also does your pick also land into one of those two zones? I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's sadly a really basic bit chance for both favorite film and favorite game, which is Golden Eye and Golden Eye. <laughs> that's good. Um, and when you say Golden Eye, uh, Golden Eye game, you mean the original rather than. Uh, I guess let's call it Reloaded, even though the Wii one was just called GoldenEye. But oh god, yeah, yeah, definitely yeah. the N sixty four one. Uh, so when was, did he, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, it was weird that came to obviously the Xbox under an addition to Rare Replay, yeah. and I was like, okay, cool, the controls. Although that was never really too much of an issue, but I was really surprised how well it held up. Yeah, I find GoldenEye interesting, and it's funny because. When we were doing our mini series uh, back in 2022 about um, Free Radical, one of the things that was kind of off in the periphery was that there was a lot of rumors around that, oh, GoldenEye was going to, it was like some people were saying, oh, they've figured out the rights, and then some people were saying it was going to be on Switch Online. And then eventually both those things did come to pass, where, yeah, they added it to Rare Replay, but then they also added it to uh, Switch Online. Very odd, though, that apparently the two versions aren't... There's no parity between them. They're, like, how they went about doing the emulation is completely different in both cases. And they have, like, different trade-offs as a result. Yeah, so I've played both partly because hmm. um, the Xbox Series X version is where I was like, right, I want to finally go through this on the highest difficulty, do all the objectives... Yeah. Um, without, you know, the frame rate and other things getting in the way and making it harder than it need be. Um, but then the Switch version was the only version that had the online multiplayer. And most of yeah. my most of my mates who I grew up with still live in another county. Um, hmm. And even, like, the people we usually meet up with, we're all scattered to the winds. So yeah, it was interesting playing both of them uh, sort of interchangeably and just seeing... They're both using emulation, and they're both using Lua scripts, clearly, but in very mm. different ways. Yeah, from what I understand, like, the Switch Online one, they didn't want to touch up too much, apart from... Because is, uh, is it only the Xbox version that has the new control scheme in it, which is dual stick, or do both of them have it? Um, so only the Series X version has the new yeah. control scheme. The Switch, you can do a workaround... You, By going into the yeah controller menu, Gosh. yeah, but you actually have to remap either your Joy Cons or your Pro controller, and then jump back into the game and switch to a different control scheme. It's like just just build it in, guys. Just build it in. Yeah, no. The, the, well, I can't imagine it would have taken a lot of hex. I mean, again, if you're doing if you're Lua scripting, I can't imagine it would have been the most difficult thing in the world. But I don't know. 
Yeah, you probably um, put more effort just making it widescreen, you know? Oh, gosh, yeah, because I know the Xbox uh, Series X version had a bit of an issue with that where they scaled stuff up and you were getting a mm. lot of, um, like, you could see the texture scenes and you get, like, a lot of shimmering artifacts because of that. God. Yeah, there's a ton of Zed fighting where you've got mm. um, two meshes meeting and you just get this horrible line down, like, the middle of the snow, for example, and you can see the skybox through it. Yeah. Uh, I will say, at least the game that we're talking about today, which, oh, by the way, folks, uh, welcome to the podcast Bullet Time, where we talk about shoots that miss their marks. I I love to do a late intro, mate. That's my thing. But um, yeah, I guess the game that we're talking about today, which going kind of back to what I said earlier about which GoldenEye version do you like more, because a lot of people would be like, oh, GoldenEye's the N64 game did get remade for the Wii, and there is an interesting story behind that, which I might dip into a tiny bit on this, just because it's relevant to the game that we're talking about today, which uh, from the year 2012 is 00 Legend, uh, 007 Legends. I was about to call it 00 Legends, which kind of rolls off the tongue a, a tiny bit nicer, but then also doesn't make a ton of sense. I mean, I don't even know what else they could have called it, like because calling it Bond Legends doesn't really clue you in too much that it would be james or james bolton legends because there's um i actually know all the games are called 007 something aren't they there's apart from the like james bond jr which weirdly relevant to the really relevant to this because that was like one of the first games that eurocom worked on when yeah, they I'm formed as a company back in the 90s but um yeah i think all the bond games are called uh 007 aren't they uh, I was just going colon. through them in my head and, and thinking, and yeah, I think Everything or Nothing, Agent Under Fire. Ah, actually, the PS2 ones, I think they've got James Bond, colon, and then the name of the game on the spine. Interesting. Yeah, because I think... Because 007 Racing is definitely 007, and then there's also... There's They're on the shelf, I could check. <laughs> no, 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 that's absolutely fine. A GoldenEye is the weird one because it's double is GoldenEye is 007 GoldenEye sixty four or GoldenEye 007. Uh, or, or maybe it might just be GoldenEye 007, I think. Yeah, I think it's GoldenEye 007, and it's one of the few N64 games that doesn't have 64 in the title. Just in case. So you had a lot of people going into Dixon's back in the day and being like, oh, but is this actually an N64 game if it hasn't got the number 64 in it? And then you got Clay Fighter trying to be cute with, what was it, 63 and a third or something. Yeah, because it was doing the Naked Gun uh, naming scheme at that point. Because, it, yeah, it was like 22 and a half and then like Sculptor's Cut and stuff like that. God, I'm not a fan of those Clay Fighter games. I know that we're not talking about the Clay Fighters, but I just thought, while it has been brought up, um, yeah, I haven't got a lot of love for Clay Fighters. <laughs> not many people have, to be fair. Uh, you'd be surprised. There's people out there who go, oh no, the, this this is a fighting game that has got like legitimate production values to it. And it's like, yeah, but actually playing it though, it's not great. I can appreciate the claymation, but yeah, it doesn't make a good game. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Um, I'm trying to think where to... Well, first things first, because Sam, I haven't introduced you yet, because uh, you're new to the pod. Uh, new in the hot seat. So... Uh, Joining us today to talk about 007 Legends, the other voice that you've been hearing on this pod so far. Uh, I mean, I guess, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? I mean, I've been calling you Sam all the way along, but you would probably be better known for your YouTube channel if you want to go into that. Uh, Yeah, so my YouTube channel has the SEO unfriendly name of Webster, uh, which is really unique and easy to find. Um... I largely do longer form video reviews of games. Um, most recently, I put out a just shy of two hour video on Arkham City. I did yes. not realize I had that much to say about that game. It is a big game. It's open world. So. Uh, debatable. <laughs> yeah, it's sort yeah. of open. It's slightly open world. Yeah. Um, but no, that's true. You do, you do put out a lot of kind of long form stuff. You haven't touched. Oh, you haven't gone into the Bond games yet, though, from what I understand, or am I completely wrong? Uh, I would like to. I've certainly had plans to. When the the Series X uh, Rare Replay GoldenEye came out, I yes. sort of 
I binged that on the highest difficulty and I was like, this still really holds up and I have so many things I want to say about this game. But because I was playing it for pleasure, for lack of a better term, um, I hadn't recorded any of the footage and I was like, am I going to play through the entire game again just for footage capture? Um, No. (laughs) Wow. I was going to say, because I always have that issue, like I've been, um, I might be dating the video a little bit, uh, sorry, dating this podcast a little bit, but mm. um, I played um, Ape Escape all the way through for research a good couple of weeks ago. And to be honest, we did end up doing a little podcast thing about that for a different project. But the idea was like, oh, I think I might want to like actually do a video on this at some point. And so I played it for research, didn't record any of it. And I was like, okay, I'm pretty sure that I want to do that. I don't know if I want to play Ape Escape again for like maybe a couple more weeks is the thing. Like I want to distance myself out enough. So like, I'm still going to, en- I'm going to enjoy it again and I'm not going to like burn myself out being like, oh, I've already done all this. This is kind of boring, but yeah, I mean, that is always the issue with content creation. It is like, you know, do you want to, cause I mean, funnily enough, you did offer if you want to, if, uh, you were gonna like record footage for this and I said oh there's no need because we're doing it as a podcast mm. but like I mean after playing it is there any kind of want to do like a video on uh, 007 Legends do you think or uh... I think it could be interesting to and this probably wouldn't be a fit for my channel not that I have much of a an audience or a, a thing or a, an established identity but it it seems popular to do like all of the bond games on ps3 all of the bond games on ps2 yeah. like these compilation videos and yeah. i could see like life after golden eye being a, a fun video topic um mm. i've certainly i've made it easier to capture footage now so i have the elgato 4k 60 s plus which is a mouthful um yeah. and that has a standalone mode where it records to an sd card So now with how my AV setup is set up, I can play in the living room in my preferred environment and just tap a button now to record hopefully high quality footage. Um, I say hopefully because it's not, where it's not connected to a PC or anything anymore, it's not an OBS. I don't find out how that capture has come out until it's too late and I put the SD card in my PC. Oh, so it's a bit of a gamble in regards to did it like, yeah to know okay yeah super convenient but also really inconsistent i've had to re-record tomb raider remastered i played through about half the game um and then realized that the for some reason the elgato was skipping frames and there was lots of grainy artifacts everywhere so i had to up the bit rate in the settings in an ini file and then put it back in and re-record hoping it came out better yeah yeah it's uh it would be I think it's maybe a video on GoldenEye saying why this still holds up, but then an interesting... I mean, you've charted that GoldenEye's legacy, that design, even the health bars, really don't live on in Bond games. They live on through Perfect Dark, Time Splitters, etc. Yeah. Yeah. It it is really interesting, like, because it does feel like there is a massive fork in the road of kind of, yeah, this sort of FPS lineage where... Yeah, GoldenEye continues, but it turns into free radical design and then sort of gains influenced by that, which there isn't a lot of them, funnily enough, but it is most... Like, it was just them kind of figuring out their own thing. But then where the Bond games splinter off, weirdly enough, kind of very near the beginning of that, not the first game that came out of that, but, like, the game immediately afterwards does begin with Eurocom. And so they're there with... Um, the world is not enough on the N64, which was like, because I think, yeah, because Tomorrow Never Dies came out after that, and that was made by a studio called Black Ops, who did, barely did anything else after that. Like, they did The World is Not Enough, never went on to anything else. And I think that was a bit more of a third person shooter. It didn't really have much use to it. And the reviews at the time just kind of panned it. It was like, coming off a of golden eye, like, this is a, you know, this is a shoddy product. Is that the one? Not- where there's a PS1 game and an N64 game and they're nothing alike? So that is The World Is Not Enough. The ah. PS1 game is more like a kind of straightforward linear action game. 
meanwhile, what Eurocom did for the N64 version was quite interesting. It basically they tried to do Deus Ex, but on the N64. So it's more, yeah, I know, like it's more of like this kind of FPS RPG hybrid where you have for the, the gadgets. Um, for the benefit of the audio format, I tilted my head like an owl. Yeah, no, you did. You thought you, <laughs> you, you uh, sampled a bit of a face uh, of just kind of like I don't quite know how that works. Well. It's interesting. They can't go all the way with Deus Ex because obviously, even with the expansion pack on the N64, like they only had so much RAM to work with. But they made it a bit more non-linear, a bit more puzzly. You had all the gadgets to kind of like figure your way stuff out. And the reviews at the time were pretty keen on it. They were like, you know, Golden Eye is a bit more action focused. This is doing a bit more about wanting to sort of recreate Bond in all of its facets. Like I don't think it has driving levels, but then that becomes a thing the Eurocom then introduces with Nightfire, which was like their first game of the PS2 era. And so with The World is Not Enough, like they have like a pretty good grasp on, well, Bond is an FPS character. Bond shooting has been figured out. What's the next step we can take with that? And it's, yeah, kind of making him a bit more of like a realized character in this world. And it's really ambitious for an N64 game. And it's funny because... We've been talking about maybe doing Bond stuff for a while. And I think mm. that's kind of, that's an idea that's still up in the air in regards to going back and doing the other Bond games. But I came to you and I was like, here are the three kind of Bonds that I'm interested in covering right now. Which is the one that you're interested in talking about? And, well, I mean, I guess I'll let you answer and I suppose why you picked 007 Legends. Yeah, I think if I remember right, it was uh, between Gold and I Reloaded. 007 yep. Legends and Bloodstone, I want to say. I think, it, I think it was Quantum. I think it was oh, because okay. I was mostly staying to the FPS ones. And Quantum, I only really picked because it was like, uh, Call of D- it was it was made by Treyarch like the same year that they made World of War. And so it was kind of reusing a lot of that tech. But um, yeah, those were the three. Yeah. Um, and 007 Legends, um, that had my curiosity. A is a bit of a cheese board where it covers five different movies. Yeah. Um, and also B from like this weird, I get oddly hung up on war and continuity sometimes. And I, yeah. I love the debate between is Bond the same guy all the way through or is it like a code name that gets passed down and you've got evidence like, well, it's not Roger Moore's Bond that married Tracy, but it is Roger visiting Tracy's grave. And, yeah. you know, why would he be there if not, oh, you know, my my predecessor's wife, I'm going to put down flowers. That, that doesn't track. So, <laughs> yeah, it'd be like if you became the new manager of like a of a restaurant and the previous manager's wife had died. And he's like, well, I got to fill his duties as a manager. And it's like, yeah, but you're not, you weren't her husband. And it's like, no, I was because I'm also the manager now. I got to do everything he did. So, and it would be pretty yeah. bold if it's like just a code name to put Teresa Bond on the gravestone. Oh yeah. yeah, gosh. So seeing like those past adventures, but all with Daniel Craig because that's who they had the likeness rights for. Um, yeah. Kind of bridges that in a nice way, although not really because none of the films get enough time to shine. But that's. Probably something sure. we'll cover later. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll get into that kind of when we talk about the games. I thought it was a pretty inspired pick after the fact because talking about the fact that Eurocom is at the beginning of the sort of trend of where Bond games went afterwards. Uh, as of the recording of this episode, I'm not sure when this is going out. It, it will go out in 2024 at some point. Hopefully, hopefully before Christmas. I am thinking maybe before Halloween. We'll see what happens. Um, or this February is probably now. Yeah, this yeah. Is, yeah, we're currently recording in February. <laughs> uh, but um, this is, for all intents and purposes, the last Bond game. There is Project 007, which was announced a couple of years ago, which is going to be made by IO. But I'm also thinking with that, I think that they were pretty much picked out by MGM for what they do best, which is the Hitman games. Mm. And I think Bond in a Hitman setting seems pretty much like it's a perfect fit, really. And especially in the World of Assassination trilogy, when they were getting towards the Hitman Freeze side of stuff, you got, like, a lot of really good, like, villains lairs in that game. And so it's just like, oh, yeah, what an absolute perfect fit. But they're not going to make an FPS game. Like, that's not them. 
And so, like, with 007 Legends, it is kind of this thing of, okay, this is the end of, for now, 007's FPS lineage. Mm. And with that, I think it's also, again, it's such an interesting, and it's what you said about the fact that they're basically doing these condensed versions of films from the five other bonds are basically represented here. Even Craig is kind of represented a little bit, but we'll sort of get into that when we get into that. I did laugh when that that introduced the credits. I laughed my ass off. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. know. Um, but like, I kind of wondered with this game is that it's almost a little bit like, and this is a bit of a stretch with my metaphor, but I'll kind of explain why. It's almost a bit of like a Sonic Generations kind of thing, where it could have been like, rather than so much recreating the films, they could have also gone the step of being like, how do we pay homage to like Bond's game history? I think that's maybe more the case with the game that they did beforehand, which was um, GoldenEye Reloaded, which again, mm. I think was kind of, I feel like that was the sort of, the platform, the you know, the, the sort of the solid ground that they built this on of, Oh, we already made a f- we already made a game which basically recreated an old thing, like recreated an old film and an old game, but we recast it with Craig. And by recasting with Craig, we also brought in a little bit of that Call of Duty juice that you know people who were already playing with with um, what do they call it with Quantum of Solace, which I believe Eurocom did the PS2 version of that game, so they already had a hand in of knowing what this was meant to look like, but also they're owned by Activision and Activision whenever another whenever other FPS games came out basically said it's Call of Duty because that's what we do and we know that that sells very well and hey GoldenEye for the Wii did incredibly well for Activision and I think this was always kind of a no-brainer um I mean I'm just trying to think of where to segue from from there I mean, let's. I guess let's introduce the game itself and to people who might not know what it is. And you've kind of already summed it up, which is that this is basically five mini FPS campaigns based on classic Bond films, not starring Daniel Craig, but in this one, he it, they, Daniel Craig stars in all of them. And in that respect, they've also been slightly updated in uh, odd ways there's some creative license yeah. yeah yeah um so uh what are the films that are being remade in dollars and legends uh, so it starts with goldfinger um yep. then we move on to uh i've got my notes here i had to write it down uh, on her majesty on her majesty's secret service and that was yes. bizarre for me because i'd only watched the film of that for the first time about two weeks before mm. um then we move on to uh, License to Kill, which yes. I somehow misidentified as Diamonds of Forever. Yes, <laughs> fine. Um, and then Die Another Day. Uh, and then finally we end with Moonraker. So we don't even go through them in release order because we jump back for Moonraker. No, it's all chronological up until the point that, yeah, for some reason they put Moonraker, because otherwise it would have been Gold- Goldfinger, Moonraker... License to Kill, uh, Die Another Day, and then... Oh, wait, no, I've missed one out. Oh, sorry. It would yeah, be... Majesty's Secret Service would be between Goldfinger, Goldfinger and... and exactly Moonraker. where it is. <laughs> oh, well, there we go, then. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is... I don't know. I think as a... As a collection of, like, okay, what Bond films do we adapt? I think, for the most part, they're all pretty good picks. Like, Goldfinger's, like... I mean, it was the second Bond film, wasn't it? And, like, mm. Doctor No is a lot slower pace there is kind of like a little shootout at the end but for the most part it's mostly just him doing a lot of covert work whereas i mean goldfinger's kind of got more of the like as as the second film they kind of figured out a lot more of that stuff like they have buddy galores in it they have him tied to the laser bed you know i I don't expect you to i expect you to die and then you have all the shootout stuff at the end in fort knox and it's like Mm. yeah now this makes sense perfect setups for little fps vignettes and they do even recreate kind of the iconic scenes from the film um like uh on her majesty's secret service it's funny because that's the one i haven't seen oh okay then like looking it up after the fact and like all the little set pieces i was like oh yeah no perfect i mean in fairness you didn't have a lot of choices with george lazenby he only did one film fair enough 
But it's quite a crucial a, one to miss as well. <laughs> I would yeah, recommend no, giving exactly. it <laughs> Oh, I know. And but a lot of cool stuff happens in that film, which yeah, good for an FBS. Um License to Kill, I mean they could have gone without or they could have gone with um what was the Dalton one that he did other than that? Uh I have not gotten that far in my watch through yet. No, that's fair enough. Because I always get, I always think that he did view to a kill, but he didn't. Because that was the last more one, wasn't it? It, it may well be. <laughs> yeah, no, that, okay, that's, that's fair enough. Um, I know that Dalton did too, but License to Kill, I mean, has like, I mean, has an interesting setting. You know, a lot of Aztec temple stuff. So yeah, that's like a kind of a nice, cool call. Again, it's Goldeneye callback because they have an Aztec temple in that game. So mm. makes sense. Die Another Day was a weird pick. Yeah, die, well, I think, do you know what the problem is? Is that what would what have been the better Brosnan film to adapt? They've oh, done GoldenEye. It. <laughs> we already did that. Never mind. Uh, what's the other one? Oh, why don't we go with the film that no one... Why don't, why don't we go with the Pierce Brosnan film that killed the Bond films for like seven years? Why don't we do Die Another Day? Yeah, I suppose I even had to think of... Because GoldenEye had just done. But yes. The World Is Not Enough had also had a game. Uh, Tomorrow yeah. Never Dies had had a game. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, they all had, um, they had all had, yeah, these were all games that were made, because I think some of the malls were, yeah, like, View to a Kale has, like, a Commodore game. But then, like, yeah, there was, like, a big gap between, yeah, none of the Daltons, I think, had any. And then there was a big gap between Dalton and then eventually Brosnan in 95 with uh, Goldeneye and then Bond just as Doom becomes the biggest game in the world, and so it all becomes FPS games from there. So From Russia of Love had a, a PS2 game. That's true, yeah. They got Connery out of the um, old folks' homes to record new lines for that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Um, he he so, just about knows where he is half the time when he's recording that game. <laughs> when he was recording it, he actually thought he was James Bond. He kept trying to pull a gun out on him, and he was like, don't do that. We're not baddies, it's fine. Um, so yeah, very, I don't know, I guess, so yeah, Dying of the Day is the only one that didn't get a games adaptation. And I guess from a, I guess if they had like, you know, you have the whiteboard and you have your post-it notes of, okay, so this section has a lot of shooting, this section has a lot of spy stuff. Yeah, we're a little bit low on the driving, which is a bottom thing. Oh, Dying of the Day has a really famous, uh, driving set piece in it, which, hey, is recreated in this game. And then Moonraker, as a choice, I think is quite inspired, but that is why they put it at the end of the game, where it was, oh, Bond goes to space. We could have a space level. Oh, this is too much fun. Let's put this at the end of the game. The The difficulty is, and mm. we'll, we'll probably come back around to this later as well, when you do Moonraker, you also have to do the Moonraker laser because N64... Yes. God and I had that bonus level. We have already had a very satisfying Moonraker laser. Uh, and spoiler alert, kids, this Moonraker laser in this game ain't it. It's not good. No. <laughs> it's not great. I mean, you know what? I might, I might just even start there with like our kind of initial thoughts of playing this game. Um, I'm going to be interested in hearing your contrasting view because I think you, from what you kind of said to me, you sort of had a bit of a positive view. I did not like this game one bit. I thought that this game was pretty pants. And I know why, which I will quickly get into now. So this game was set to release for fifth, uh, for Bond's 50th anniversary. It was meant to be a tie-in to Skyfall. Skyfall, the film, which is interesting. Like Skyfall was kind of like a nice sort of wraparound in regards to they had rebooted Bond with Craig mm. to make him a bit more like Jason Bourne. And I thought that the first uh, Casino Royale, really, really solid film. It is like, you know, it follows in the Batman Begins template, but hey, it doesn't matter if, you know, it, if it, ain't it doesn't drunk. matter if you come somebody else as long as you do it well. And they did it really well. So I got no issues with that. Then Quantum came afterwards and people were a bit, well, Quantum was written during the writer's strike, so it wasn't quite like, it was a bit half-baked. But like, that was kind of the issue with that film. But then it kind of felt with Skyfall that they were a bit, oh, we need to sort of align Bond identities a bit more, but still keep it within the Craig mode. So they bring back Q, but they update him so he's a bit more like a computer hacker. They bring back the gadgets, but they make him a bit, well, I mean, he makes the joke in the film, it's like a gun on the radio is not exactly Christmas, is it? Like, And that's all he gets in that film is literally just a biometric gun and a, and a radio so he can call people in. 
that is literally it. And then obviously with, and then at the end, it's like you find out, oh, Money Penny's back. Like this was a character earlier on in the film, but they've kind of, you know, they were teasing what that was going to be. And then in the last section of that, well, also the bad guy is kind of like a classic Bond throwback in regards to big personality. Also does kind of the gross Bond thing of like all of his old villains had like facial deformities. Mm. This guy is Javier Bardem, so it's like, oh, he's a handsome Hollywood actor. And then he takes his, like, dentures out and his face clap, and he's like, oh, okay, so he actually does look like Bond villain, fair enough. And then right at the end, they bring in the, the Aston Martin with the uh, with the guns behind its uh, fog lights. And it's like, okay, so you've just realigned this now. This is a bum bum bum. that is a Bond film. And the game's kind of trying to do the same thing of, hey, this is going to be our... Craig spin on all of these different Bond films. And they use the kind of a really interesting setup, which is at the beginning of Skyfall, uh, Bond's on a train trying to track somebody down. Uh, meanwhile, there's a new recruit who's trying to get a bead, uh, a sniper's bead on the person on the train. Mm. Accidentally shoots Bond. Bond falls off the train, starts to drown, and that is where Adele's Skyfall theme comes into the film. But the game says... He starts drowning, and as he is dying, his life starts to flash before his eyes. And thus, we go to all these classic Bond films. I think it's an interesting thing as well in regards to how they sequenced it, because you could also argue that as he slips deeper into the coma, the more fantastical these adventures, and the less realistic these adventures got, like... You read into that further than I did. (laughs) Yeah. Um... So it's a cool concept, but the problem was was that they needed this game at, like, GoldenEye Reloaded was... So GoldenEye for the Wii came out in 2010, GoldenEye Reloaded came out, like, the year later. And so they basically have, like, like an Activision basically said, oh yeah, we want you for the next Bond game. Oh, it's the film's coming out in 2012. Yeah, chop chop, get it out. And it's like, oh, shit, well we haven't got any, like, time to work on this. And so a lot of corners were cut. And you can kind of see it in the end product, but I think just as an idea of doing five campaigns that all kind of shifted in looks and stuff, very commendable, but just the end product didn't, much like the bullet time uh, name, yeah, didn't hit its mark. But that's sort of my feeling. I haven't quite got into why yet, but uh, Sam, what about you? What did you think of Double Seven Legends? Um, so... Overall, I didn't mind it. Okay. I had some trouble um, actually getting to play it due to some... Oh, yeah. We we didn't go into this. Yeah. Do you want to tell the folks at home about um, how you have gone above and beyond to make this episode happen? Uh, In short, my controllers, my official controllers were displaying issues. Um, One of them was picking up ghosted D-pad inputs, and because the gadgets are on the D-pad... I, Bond like kept bringing his smartphone out every five seconds. It's like I don't, I don't <laughs> like, want. like like he's bored in work and he's just like, oh, what's on Twitter? Well, this is uh, look at the scope of my phone yeah, while getting shot at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how bored he is. Um, so I was like, okay, fine. That's been on the way out for a while. So I got my Player Two official pad. And I'm like, this has had less wear. This isn't my daily driver. Uh, it turns mm. out the right stick is balked on that, so um, oh, dang. he was just constantly like doing circles, <laughs> just like painting circles with the gun. And it's like, no, that's not going to work. So then I went to, I've got a couple of like those aftermarket pads, so it's the same mold and everything, but it says P3 instead of the PlayStation logo in the middle. Yeah, uh, And consistently across those, there was an issue where um, if you were trying to go upright, um, so I guess north east on the left stick, Bond just stopped. Huh. And I I didn't know what was going on. I I think I sent you a link where other people were having the same issue. Yeah. Uh, although that was an emulator, and there was one person saying, No, this happens on real hardware too. I was like, oh, maybe I should just get the 360 version. Um it turns out that it's similar to um so the stick sensitivity is set weird for some PS3 games. And the same thing happens in Yakuza 3, where uh, you keep stopping and starting during the chase segments on 
a lot of aftermarket or dying PS3 controllers because they don't do the full range of movement on the sticks. Mm. Um, so definitely if you're looking to play it, you are going to need... I ended up fixing my official controller and then I had full full range on the sticks I could play it. Um, but yeah, if you're playing PS3 version, you are going to need a pad that's in good nick. Um, otherwise you are, you're going to have problems. <laughs> Yeah, so funnily enough, I think this is the first episode of Bullet Time that we're doing after I bought a PS3, because my mm. plan is is that I want to dig in more of... And again, like sort of to go back to this game, and it's like this kind of came out in the perfect sort of era of the stuff that I want to cover on Bullet Time, which is like the 360 PS3 era, where initially it was a lot of games that wanted to be Halo, and then it was a lot of games that wanted to be Call of Duty, and just all these sort of odd directions that it went into. And the PS3 is just like a cavalcade of like games that ever came to any other console. Some of the first part, like there are mm. two Sony exclusive FPS franchises that are on the PS3 that like no Resistance and Killzone? Killzones and Resistance, yeah. yeah. Funnily enough, like Killzone obviously made by Gorilla, who probably better known today for um, Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, Resistance, though, is like a complete blind spot in people's memory of um, Insomniac. The guys who started with Spyro, then Ratchet, and are now better known for doing the Spider-Man games onto Sony. But there was just this long period during the PS3 where they wanted to do their take on Halo mixed with Medal of Honor. And then when Call of Duty became bigger, the series then started to shift in the direction of Modern Warfare, which is Mm. quite odd. Resistance was an odd one, and I'll, I'll come back to 007 Legends and my impressions in a sec. But um, I remember Resistance coming out, and my uni housemate had a PS3, and mm. we sat playing it on co op. And there was a point where I just turned to him and I was like, I gotta be honest, mate, I'm not really feeling this one. It's been like no. the past half hour or so has just been noise. And he his reply was, oh, thank God, I was hoping you'd say something an hour ago. <laughs> and we just turned it off mid-campaign, never to return. <laughs> you know, I had exactly that same experience with, I lived with a guy who bought a PS4 on launch and got all of the PS4 launch games that you could possibly get for it. We did Nat Co-op. Nat is an incredibly strange game that I want to, like, I don't know if I'll do a video on it. Maybe I'll do a podcast on it at some point, because I think there is stuff to dig into there. But yeah, that game is a lot weirder than, like, like if you only know the game for the from the donkey memes, like no, there is like a lot more strange stuff to Knack that goes beyond. I that. liked Knack. It was uh, it took me back to different times and a different era of game design. A little, that's the thing. I thought it would do the same thing again, but then the plot kind of goes in so many odd directions in that game, where it's just sort of like. It, it felt like, you know, one of those, like, kind of straight-to-DVD French CGI films that then somebody else tried to translate, but they couldn't speak, like, the language. So they just came up with their own plot. But there's, like, really violent scenes. In- I'm talking about that. What I want to talk about is he also bought Killzone Shadowfall. Now, that is a game that no one, like... That that has been mem- that has been memory hold from, like, games Very history, pretty. But- Oh, incredibly pretty, yeah. yeah. Like, it, well, I mean, again, like that became the basis of what they ended up doing with Horizon Zero Dawn, which was an incredibly pretty game, but also a lot more playable because it's like a Far Cry game versus Kill Zone, which was like this weird, like it's just a very blocky FPS game. Like that's the mm. only thing I can describe it as. And I'm just watching him play this, and I'm just like, this, this isn't very good. And he looks at me, and he goes. Yeah, no, it's not very good. <laughs> so, so. And then so, played Resogun for the rest of the sesh. So, so this kind of ties back to 007 Legends in that my wife was sitting watching me play the bulk of my sessions. And the first session, the, the Goldfinger movie, I was like, mm. good God, if I wasn't playing this game for a podcast, I'd be out. I'd be quitting now. <laughs> um, and then oddly, like the second session, because I'm sort of doing two movies a session, essentially. Yes. Um, I sort of found a groove and mm. it was, yeah, blurred together a bit, but it was fine, if that makes sense. And she's there uh, like, why are you playing this? This is awful. Every bad decision they could make, they're making. I'm like, it's not that bad. It's fine. I'm actually having an all right time. She's like, I don't know how. (laughs) 
it is funny that you say that because it is like this is like a greatest hits of Bond films, but it is also it could be considered like the greatest hits of completely middle of the road FPS games from this era. It has like Call of Duty waypointing in it. It has mm. like a hundred different set pieces, but well, it, it, it's I always call it the buffet analogy, where it's like you've done a hundred different things in this game, but no one thing is that good. It's all just very bland across the board. It has the smartphone or as I call it, the Arkham phone, because it gives you Batman's Sex Edition, which is pretty good. Uh, it has mini games in it. It has, uh, it's, it's got it all going on, and I guess we'll get into them as we get from plot to plot. You say that this game starts with Gold Knight. Um, this Goldfinger. Like a, oh, sorry, go, yeah, sorry, Goldfinger. I mean, we started talking about Gold Knight on the podcast, but this game starts with Gold... Well, the I mean, film, in a well, the sense... Game has- yeah. Considering how much it's still built on like that Call of Duty engine they repurpose for GoldenEye, it kind of starts with GoldenEye. Yeah, it starts yeah. with GoldenEye and it also kind of starts with World of War as well. Um, yeah, really, I was going to say, the Goldfinger section of this game was like a brick wall. It took me a few attempts of just sitting down and like swallowing it and going, okay, I just need to get through this. That initial gold finger well well the gold finger section literally begins with you go into the coma fantasy and the next thing you see is there's the scene from gold finger of the um i can't remember her name but she wakes up dead on the bed covered in gold but mm. he also gets a smartphone call and it's like ha hey, hey, you can't stop me oh i'm gonna stop you boom cut to credits not very interesting credits um the sort of UI sort of graphic motif they're going for in this game is a lot of kind of like bubbles and bubbles forming people's faces. It's very PS1 demo it's, one. I think it's meant to be the air escaping as he drowns. Yeah, yeah. And it's like the memory and they're forming together into like these chaotic memories. But you know what? Missed opportunity. They should have done little credits for each section rather than mm. just doing credits for 007 Legends. But that's my only... Yeah, I mean, there were times the... I thought I was yeah. playing Diamonds of Forever until I finished the first mission of that part of the game and it said license to kill. Yeah. And, then, and then the level name I was like, ah, okay. So those those little intro sequences might have clued me in that I had yeah. no idea what the fuck I was playing. <laughs> but then I don't know, they would have had to done the thing of like Daniel Craig Bond saying to himself, Oh, I remember this mission where I fought Goldfinger or Oh, I was doing this mission on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Kind of, like, really over the side. By the way, I mean, speaking technically, of Craig, he does every yeah. mission on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Well, no, exactly. So it's a little bit, and like saying, oh, this one I had licensed to kill. And it's like, well, you've always had a license to kill. Like, that's the thing. Well, I guess I'll die another day. Um, speaking of Craig, um, so I kind of want is that a, now. <laughs> yeah, this film is a star studded affair in regards to. Judy Dench is in for M. Naomi Harris, who was uh, Money Penny at the time, is in for Money Penny. They even have the guy who plays Tanner, who's basically in all of these Bond games. Like the um, Rory Kinnear, he's like the only person who will get in the vocal booth and do the audio. And so he's also the guy who does the tutorial audio, pretty much all of the radio stuff. Like he, he is in the can for it. Only person they couldn't get, despite the fact that they got him for Goldeneye uh, Reloaded, was Craig himself. Um, oh. He was ha- he was happy to do that. Wasn't fussed to do Double Seven Legends, so they got a sound alike, who for the most part kind of sounds like Craig. But it's also one of those things that, like in your head, like you know, anyone can do a Sean Connery or can do a Roger Moore. Nobody can really do a Daniel Craig, can they? Um, I mean, I hadn't noticed until you just brought it up. So I'd, I'd say in terms of a sound alike, it sounded enough alike. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. He, he wasn't like rapping or speaking in like a thick Irish accent or, or like a Jamaican patois. So in regards to just sounding like a Matt, it's just sounding like James Bond guy. It works. Yeah. It wasn't like he came on with a thick Norfolk accent all ooh ah Oh, That would have been good, though. If you could have picked the different accents, uh, or if like, or like when he's doing the Goldfinger level, he's just doing like the world's worst Sean Connery impression, but as Daniel Craig. Oh God! <laughs> God. Um, Before so my third God- stroke, I talked like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So Goldfinger's kind of boring as a beginning because you go from the woman dead on the bed, which okay, cool visual. Boom. What's the nice thing? 
you're sneaking into a base, like, mm. and, and it's like cold. And so, it looks like, weirdly enough, it kind of is like the intro to the GoldenEye remake as well, where you were doing similar stuff. Um, well, it made me laugh because yeah. it said, maintain your cover. First line is, Bond, maintain your cover. And then you activate an EMP as a fighter jet is going over. The fighter mm-hmm. jet crashes in flames due to the EMP, and you drop down and start shooting everybody. And it's like, okay, we're we're super spy James Bond not getting caught. So I'm gonna blend my toughest together because I wasn't sure should we do film by film or should we? Because I always think, well, if you're doing a James Bond game, what are the things that you need to get right? First things for this shooting. Second thing, second gadgets, then driving, then like presentation and kind of spy mm. stuff. So I guess why don't we start with the first one, which is shooting. Now, I don't know whether this is just because I'm not super used to PS3 FPS games. It could be a little bit of that. Might even just be this. This is not a good feeling game. This feels like a very not good FPS game. <laughs> yeah, this has... And I find this with most PS3 FPSs, especially ones that literally are reusing Call of Duty. Um, mm-hmm. You can't really aim freely. You just sort of have to know that the auto aim's really strong. And you're just sort of yes. like tapping L1 to snap to a target, holding R1 to fire, snap to, tar- to the next target, fire. And it's sort of, I think that's why it became this blur about midway through because you're doing so many of the raids and the climaxes of the film you just sort of run into a corridor l1 r1 l1 r1 l1 r1 okay everyone's dead move and it's you can sort of just shut off and autopilot it yeah like i was like you were saying earlier that goldeneye still kind of holds up and one thing i would say about it is that it has the time splits thing of like it was very hard on that episode to discuss, to kind of discuss well why does the shooting and time split isn't two feel so good, and I guess I can describe it now by describing well, what is the opposite of that like what is bad feeling FPS shooting? It's very mushy feeling, as in you kind of push sticks and you don't feel like you move quickly enough, which is where the really strong aim assist kicks in. But the moment you go down sights, it's like it goes from mushy to squirrely, like it's really doesn't feel great. Um, I don't know, and bear in mind I had problems with controllers no, for, sure, sure, for a while, sure. but yeah. it felt too loose um, when I was firing from the hip, and it okay. felt too um, magnetized to the enemy when I was aiming down sights, and it was to the point where like there would be an enemy five feet from Bond, and mm. then there would be another enemy about 20 feet behind that guy, Okay. And I would get the cursor roughly over the guy who's the immediate goddamn threat, hit R1, and Bond would lock onto the bloke half a mile behind him. I'm like, yeah. no. <laughs> you know what? Now you mentioned that. Yeah, no, I did have a lot of... Yeah, when I was aiming down sights, it was it was just bouncing around the room. It's just It was like Robocop. It was just basically snapping to whatever guy it could look at. So no, I think that's... I think that's fair enough. And I think as well, I might just be used to sort of Xbox stuff has always been tuned a little bit differently, like mm. not quite keyboard and mousey, but they do, I don't know, just just however they manage the stick stuff is just a little bit better. But So I would say this isn't the first PS3 FPS game I've played, but the, fir- but the first one I'm talking about on Bullets, so not a good first impression on that, but I am willing to chalk that up less to the console and maybe more to this style of game because mm. yeah i can i can't quite remember like i haven't played a call of duty game in a while and to be honest i should really replay modern warfare for this podcast not to cover it but just to kind of like have the context of this oh, is what all these games were yeah it's yeah. raining on and but i've always felt like um from what i remember it modern warfare felt better than what this feels like oh god yeah 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 um I I spent so much of this game confused. Um, mm. Like, I had done, in my uni years, I don't think I could do it now, um, but, like, it was a ritual in our uni house to get each Call of Duty and each Halo on release yes. night at midnight, and then we'd all sit up. It had to be on Legendary for Halo. It had to be on Veteran for Call of Duty, um, and we would we would get through it. Um, that was just sort of the done thing, but I came to, to this and I don't know, something wasn't 
clicking or feeling right. And it was, um, it was sort of that poor imitation thing, but Hmm. then it starts throwing me like, and this might just be sheer conveyance and bad um, instructions by the game, but like GoldenEye, yes, you had the additional objectives. They were shown to you Hmm. on a dossier before you started the goddamn mission. Um, Goldfinger, I go into a door and it comes up, objectives failed. And it turns out the room before, I was meant to plant tracking devices on a couple of vans. And I'm like, the only time I've been told that is when I have failed to do that. If you don't tell me that I need to do that, then of course I'm not going to be like, oh, hang on a minute. I just need to stop by these vans for a second. It's funny you mention that, because yeah, I guess, um, because both of us both do instructional design for a living, both at the same company. We'll go into that. We we'll won't go into too much details on that because we not, don't want to dox anyone. But yeah, like in regards to how this game conveys stuff to you, not very good. Um, mm-hmm. You get like, and I barely notice these. Like I, funnily enough, it was mostly through, because um, I watched like a couple of other people's videos for like sort of reference and research. Um, in the bottom left corner, you get these little pop-ups now and again, which is like headshot, 500 points, completed objective, 2,000 points, kind of. You, you're just kind of getting fake XP as you're going along, which, I mean, you do, you can spend in a shop to, quote, upgrade your guns and upgrade the stuff the bomb can do. But it's Yeah, you really... can, like, regen health faster and, and such. But it was only when I saw a loading screen tip halfway into the game that I realized I didn't just have to buy those upgrades. I also had to equip them. So I was there thinking, oh, I've boosted my health. That hasn't made much difference. <laughs> it's because no. I bought it but not equipped it. <laughs> No, it's it's funny, and again, like the thing with the Bond games is that they've, despite the fact that they're based on like you know films that do massive amounts of money, they've never really been like say quote triple A in regards to like the level of polish they get. Which I think is so funny because it's like you don't get stuff like Uncharted without the Bond games. I think in regards to like, well, what is the template for making like a Hollywood style game? And it's something that EA Redwood I think were very good at because they were the ones who did. Everything or Nothing, and then um, From Russia With Love. And I think mm. that their PS3 Bond games are just really solid in regards to... They don't push the envelope on anything, but like as third-person shooters go, they are like incredibly well-made. And I would say that that would probably have been the template for all third-person shooters going forward if Resident Evil 4 never came out. Like... Because I was thinking of this in regards to Tomb Raider Legend, which is, oh, we need to reboot. Well, they did Anniversary, and then it was like, okay, what does Lara Croft look like in the year 2005? Well, she's going to be, you know, this third-person action character, but nobody's figured out what cover is yet, so it's going to be a little bit more acrobatic and a lot more jumpy about it. Versus Bond, which is like, no, this is kind of taking more from Splinter Cell, and so you have sort of stealth elements to it. It's a little bit more considered but no one's figured out cover yet. And I think in a future where RE4, you know, I don't know, maybe they put out the Hawkman version and, and people were like, oh, this is just, this is Code Veronica all over again. We don't care about this. And it never figured out that kind of like robotic style movement, you know, Cliffy B never would have went, oh, I want to make that game at Epic, but I want to combine it with Kill Switch. Like, we never go down that pathway and so we never figure out cover shooting and i think if uh, that happens, somewhere in a corner operation winback is crying yeah no yeah winback is like winback is getting like video yeah it's the the, the snaker video on winback still comes out and it's like oh, this would have been an, <laughs> this would have been an interesting way that fps has could have gone but we never really did that um yeah like I think Uncharted, as much as it takes it iterates on Gears of War, I think it is also looking at the EA Redwood stuff and stuff like mm. Legend and going, how do we make this a little bit more fun and kind of, you know, fizzy feeling? Uncharted which, very go- much looked at Tomb Raider and said, hold my beer. Uh, yeah. Which is telling because we've got another Tomb Raider reboot, the third goddamn timeline in 2013. And yeah. Lara was copying Nathan Drake all of a sudden. And you know what the funniest thing about that is? And, like, I, I only kind of knew this from doing research about, like, um, for different games and stuff like that. But Naughty Dog and uh, Crystal D are basically, they're both in the same city and they basically shared a talent pool for decades. Huh. Usually people who do their time at um, Crystal Dynamics, 
well, so when they were doing the original Crash Bandicoot, they just pulled a ton of people off the, the original Gex team to help them put it together. And then a bunch of people who did their time at Naughty Dog on like um Jack and Daxter then went to go work at Crystal D on that two on Tomb Raider Legend. And hey, a lot of them then ended up back at Naughty Dog working on Uncharted. Like um the guy who's the current head of um uh Crystal Dynamics is a uh, Uncharted guy. Like he's like again, so they just have pretty much the same talent pool. So yeah, I guess it's they not- also I think they also shared an office with Insomniac for a while, and that's why like Crash and Spyro have demos for each other in each other's games. Yeah, so they yeah. were both working for Universal at the time, and yeah, Universal had them in the same offices just to yeah, kind of keep them together. So yeah, I just find it really in- just kind of this interesting sort of like microcosm of like, oh, this is why all these games are very kind of similar. This is 007 Legends, which doesn't have any of that fizziness or any of that kind of... Imagine- oh, it still oh, tries I- to have stealth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do we want- so, let- let's go into that, because after you clear out everyone on the forecourt and, I guess, Cold Fingers base, uh, you then go inside. Uh, then you're introduced with the Arkham phone, which, I mean, I guess, let's just breeze through this, because there's not really much to say. So this is Craig time. Craig doesn't have silly gadgets and stuff like that he does in mm. this game but you don't get them all the time but um his thing is he uses sony uh sony ericsson smartphones because sony were the people who were making these films at the time and so he's pulling his phone out he's using it like a camera he's using it like uh, as a fingerprint cool. reader and there's one that detects electrical signals yes yeah so the arkham phone stuff is and again the reason i call it that because one of the first things you do is oh Put it into, like, infrared mode or, like, purple red mode, I guess is what it looks like, to find kind of um, nerve gas. And it then turns into the bit from Arkham Asylum where it's like, oh, I'm going to fo- I'm going to follow Boyle's... Um, oh, the alcohol st- breath. Yeah, yeah I'm, fo- I'm, I'm just following the alcohol in the air. And so you're doing exactly the same thing in this, but it's following the smell of nerve gas, which is... Fair enough. You also do use it for all <laughs> Yeah, hello, so I can see plumes of it through this camera. How am I nailing it? Yeah. Um, and yeah, you use it for electrical stuff and fingerprint reading, which mostly kicks in in basically pace-breaking moments where, okay, you've done a lot of shooting, now you've had a cutscene. Let's just have a bit where you go into it. And it's always the same thing. Let's go into the big bad guy's office and try and yep. find the plans. And so... The game you got go into- so fed up of me in the license. I think it was the license to kill one that the helper character, the woman from the CIA, I forget her name, um, mm-hmm. eventually just solved the puzzle for me and went, James, over here, over here, it's behind here. Right, all right. Pussy, Pussy ended up doing the same thing for me in um, Goldfinger, which is annoying because I knew where all the stuff was. It's just I mm. didn't know what to do with it. Like, you had to go up and click it. And it's like, okay, well, I didn't really. Why didn't you put on an on-screen prompt or something to let me know to do that? Because you do that. For See, when, else. when we were, where I thought you were going with that was somewhat slightly different when you were like, oh, you take out everyone in the forecourt and stealth. Because there's a, a corridor before you get to that point. So you're following Pussy towards hmm. the big bad's office to do this investigation. And you get your first mandatory stealth section with the stealth tutorial. And it's like, oh, use your watch to create a distraction with this speaker so that the guards move. Yeah. But the guards moved and into a position where they were still blocking the corridor and I would still get seen by them every time. I ended up, I don't think I did it the way the developers intended. Basically, I just ran up to both of them, hit them both before they could turn red and they were on the floor. Um yeah. But that that stealth tutorial was the worst <laughs> stealth tutorial I've ever had. And it's funny because there's a stealth tutorial before that which goes on for five minutes where Tanner explains to you, okay, use enemy detection cones. When it's yellow, they've seen you. And when it fills up, then it turns oh, red. Oh, God, that. Sneak around. Go into crouch mode and sneak around. Use some silenced weapons in order to take them out. If you want to move between... Like, this game doesn't have cover in it, but they still explain to you, like, the concepts of cover, like, you're playing Gears of War. Just and this so... is all using flat 2D images on an isometric grid to try and explain it as well. It's like, mm-hmm. this isn't this isn't going to translate very well. No, and the thing that you said earlier of, like, 
like this is the thing that and i guess like if i was doing the bullet time bingo card this would be a slot on it which is quote unquote stealth sections which fall apart like a second in and just turn into arenas just fucking mm. shooting arenas again there is no risk to you go into like this sort of foundry room where there's just guys sort of circling about yeah you just start taking shots it doesn't matter as long as you're using it's not i wouldn't even say using cover in the way of gears of war if it's just if you just put yourself in front of like a pillar or like you crouch behind a like railings you're fine you just keep sliding in and out and just taking the odd shot but it's weird because um it's you can get caught as long as it doesn't say critical stealth area at the top um yes. which became a problem in goldfinger license to kill and moonraker and it was particularly egregious in License to Kill because I snuck my way through an area that had, uh, I think, five enemies total. Um, mm-hmm. And then a little bit later, the base is exploding and you have to escape. You go back through the same room, guns blazing, and take out like <laughs> 20 men. And I'm like, tell me again why I had to sneak through here five minutes Well, now ago? it's exploding, so you no longer have the element of surprise working for you, I guess. But... So, oh, I can't possibly be seen by these five guys, but I can bust in with an AK against 20. Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, so yeah, so this is where it's like trying to explain all this stuff to you. And then there's also like weapon caches where you can change what guns you have. And- Mm. yeah because it's halo well because it's call of duty because it's halo two weapon limit which okay fair enough that's what everybody was doing at this point but that surprised me actually because it was i was cycling between three oh actually yeah it is like three it's like Mm. you always have a pistol on you and then you have two kind of larger firearms yeah i couldn't quite figure this out but like yeah because it didn't really show up as free like sometimes it would only Mm. let me cycle between two and then sometimes cycle between three it might be dependent on how much ammo i had actually which i know i never got the gun i was expecting and whenever it was like hold square to pick up this weapon i never knew okay which of my current three is this going to replace yeah and they never explain the system to you like okay you have small firearms like pistols and smgs you have like medium firearms and large like snipers or rockets or whatever Mm. they never yeah, a lot of a uh, lot of cut corners in this game in regards to explaining stuff. Uh, you go through the Goldfinger base though, and then you sneak onto a train, and then you see Pussy and Goldfinger having a chat with each other. This is where the sort of weird clashes begin to happen because Goldfinger and Pussy Galore look like, well, Pussy Galore especially looks like uh, Ursula Andress, like mm. the actress as she looked in the nineteen sixties when this film was made. And her clothes and all and Goldfinger's clothes look like they did in that film. Yeah. But they are standing in like sort of blue tinted Bourne style train yards and all of their henchmen are ba- are like quite modern looking and are using modern style weapons. So it's a bit like Okay, something's not quite clicking here, but fair enough, I see. It d- it becomes less of a problem as they go on, like, the later films, I think. And then completely goes out the window with Moonraker, but I guess we'll get there when we get there. But... Yeah, I mean, there's not too much more to say about Goldfinger apart from they recreate the, the, the do you expect me to talk scene, mm. but way less interesting than the film. <laughs> Yeah, I did just like the nod to, um, this goes back to like the fan theories and the lore and stuff, which despite not having seen all of the films yet, I do spend too much time reading about this stuff where he's like, well, 008 will replace me. And just like that, that indication that there is, you know, 0056, sure. so on and so forth. That's, that's always a nice touch, but yeah, it's sort of like we have that scene and the level, because most of the films are, are two levels, basically. Yes. I had that scene and then the level ended and it's suddenly like, oh, you failed to get the stealth bonus and the time trial bonus. And I'm like, again, this is the first time hearing about them. <laughs> uh-huh. It's very old school game design stuff of, oh, you played the level once. Now now go for the big bonus. And it's like, yeah, but this works in Golden Knight because the levels were only five minutes long if you knew what you were doing. The levels in these go on for, they just really stretch them out because that's the Call of Duty design. Uh-huh. At times, 45 minutes, but I suspect oh, yeah. that they don't count your deaths. 
And something I noticed, especially when I was getting to grips with the game in the gold thing uh, section and, and dying more than I would like to admit, the fucking load times. There were points where oh, I Oh, the load times were abysmal. Yeah. I think I spent more time looking at a loading screen than I did actually having the next attempt. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a... Uh, I almost wonder whether I should have tried to see if I could get a digital copy for the Series S or whatever, because I imagine the loading size probably would have been a bit quicker. But unfortunately, you can't get this. Oh, yeah, and not to not to jump to the end of the episode too much, but yeah, you can't get this game anymore. This is no longer available anywhere because of the Bond license expired by Activision, so. which has a really fun impact on the uh, the ending, uh, which <laughs> we'll get out when we get there. Yeah, that, we but. will get to that. The only other thing I was going to say in the so in the first part of the Golden Eye section where you're investigating his office, you kind of go to like his headquarters which has like a bunch of old planes and stuff in it mm. you do like a very tight close as you're escaping there's this like very close quartery kind of shooting section as you're getting out which took me a couple of attempts to get through just because i hadn't quite figured out the rhythm of combat yet the bit then you get the laser table and then you he get he takes you to fort knox you have like this big old fight outside which is very kind of call of duty feeling as well and then it literally turns into modern Hmm. and then it literally turns into modern warfare where they go okay um what's something that we can do with an fps section where we don't have to like make any new mechanics night vision let's just put a big old black vignette around the screen so you have less field of view and put a big green filter on it so it's harder to figure out the contrast of stuff that's the challenge that's like a that's like the animal riding levels in crash bandicoot you're still a platformer, but you're not in charge of how fast you can go. In, and in this, you're not in charge of how much you can see or how much detail you have. So, so Fort Knox had some of the absolute worst of the game that almost made me yeah. quit it. And then, oddly, some of the more fun parts of the game. It's Okay. It started on a bad foot. So at the start, Felix's model is sort of like pulling you out of the way and then he hands you a gun and stuff. Felix disappeared. Uh, he was a floating gun in the air and nothing else. Oh, I else. had that happen in my game as well, actually, yeah. Oh, oh Christ, it's it's spreading. It's a widespread... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a widely known bug, I guess. Um, and then the first thing it does is you're in this, you know, outside area and they're like, take out the RPGs. The first, like, seven deaths were before I had even seen the RPGs and mm. I was just getting one-shotted by them. That was... That was awful. Followed by a section where you get to these barriers and they're like, you have to lower the barriers. I'm like, okay, the controls are inside this tower, which I can only access from the other side of the barrier, and I can vault over everything else that's the height of this barrier, so surely I can vault this. I just kept getting shot time and time again trying to vault a barrier you can't vault. What you have to do is use the smartphone electrical hacking thing through the window from the outside of the guard tower. And I'm like, I I I can't even remember how I accidentally stumbled upon the solution, but I was just, it's one of those moments of, are you kidding me? Yeah, the game isn't, doesn't point you towards this stuff very well. Uh, mm. We haven't mentioned the smartphone hacking minigame, which I think is the same all the way through, which is... Uh, pushing on are, the triggers to kind of, oh no there are there are there a couple are of different hacking mini games yeah. but yeah the the one where you you have to keep it within the sort of the safety areas uh which is no fun on the ps3 not quite trigger back triggers so yeah l2 and r2 analog triggers are not good <laughs> on the ps3 no, no, um, fan of them. no and then there's the other one which I actually didn't mind so much it was just a little time consuming where you've got like the colored wheels and they all have yes. to match up uh, that, that wasn't too bad. Yes, it, it was fine, I guess. It, it, the fact that I can't, I couldn't quite remember them versus the stupid trigger ones, I guess, says you know might be more damning than remembering the stupid trigger one. So, um, you know, once we yeah. were once we were in Fort Knox, I didn't mind the whole. You know, it was a corridor shooter, but I was like, okay, well, I've I've got sort of the, the muscle memory for this, and I sort of went from the outside section where I was dying, as I say, spending more time on the loading screen than I was actually playing because of the frequency of deaths. And then inside, I think that entire section, I maybe died once. Yeah. 
and I will say, you know, like, the night vision section does, I mean, it's kind of whatever, but, like, it does work, and you know that it works because they keep bringing it back into later levels, even where it doesn't, wouldn't have made a lot of sense, but hey-ho. But I did, there's a gameplay mechanic that's at the the end of Fort Knox that I'm sure has happened sooner and we've not discussed yet. The, um, well, I think as my wife put it, why is we punch out in Bond? Um, so yeah, the tutorial for that is when you're with Pussy and it's before when you were talking about using the laser watch to mm. quote unquote activate speakers to move guards around where the speaker which they give you in the tutorial is the wrong one. If you activate that, that puts them in the wrong place. You need to go around the corner, activate two other ones in order to get the Oh, one. that's what I was meant to do. Okay. Yeah, no, and I only figured that from having to do that section again. But um yeah, they give you um yeah, they give you punch out, but it's funny because mm. it's not even quite punch out, it's more like heavy rain, where the combat in that game where where it's like, oh, push the stick up and that's a right hook, and then push this one up. Yeah. And it was like um, L1 and R1 to block and stuff. It was just like, oh, this is this and is not like, it. <laughs> and there's a big enemy health bar, and with the first guy it just says like guard or whatever. But the Fort Knox ends with you fighting odd job. Uh, who you do meet earlier, funnily enough, but he doesn't do much. But in this one, you get to, you get to do punch out with odd job, which is exciting. As much as I remember of that film, the the climax of the fight, you know, shocking him. That mm-hmm. I think that's accurate enough. Like they do take yeah. a lot of liberties throughout all of these films, and they are not especially on Her Majesty's Secret Service, which we will oh, get yeah. to, but. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, yeah, him shocking odd jobs good, and then, you know, he starts the bomb for going off, and it's like, oh, good job, James. Uh, and then it flashes to him on the plane with Pussy Galore, and it's just like, well, it's gonna be a five-hour flight, what do you want to do? I don't know, have sex, I guess. Boom, door opens, Goldfinger's not actually dead, dressed like a general. How am I gonna get rid of him? Oh, I guess I'll shoot the window and watch him get blown out. Cool. And then that's the end of the set. You don't actually see the resolution to that. He just runs to the front of the cabin and that's it. Yeah. And this is a weird thing. Like, because they've got such limited runtime for all of the yeah. films, um, you sort of, even though the levels are 45 goddamn minutes at times, you don't really get this natural build up or anticipation, which means you sort of go into these big raids or finales and there's no there's nothing to pay off no and it's weird as well because it's like there's also no kind of narrative through flow to the game apart from one thing which is and i guess this would be jumping ahead a little bit but her majesty's secret service the end of that is obviously the end of the film which is Mm. tracy bond getting shot on the side of the road and then it flashes to um license to kill where uh, Felix's wife also gets shot, and so it's doing a kind of thematic mirroring of. Yeah, yeah I, I actually wrote word for word in my notes. Oh look, another dead girl on a bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they can't. Um, okay, maybe that's the thematic through line. It's like ah, that Goldfinger adventure where the woman was dead on the. Oh, maybe that was the thematic through line. Was just like hmm, me getting shot by a woman at the beginning of this film. Reminds me of all the women who have died through all these adventures going from here to here. Apart from Jinx, I guess, and Die Another Day. Which, I mean, I guess we'll talk about Jinx when we get there. But, um, yeah. So, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, the film that I haven't seen, although weirdly enough, I know that that's like, it wasn't like a particularly popular one when it came out. And again, with Lazenby, it was his only film. And people were kind of like, oh, he only did one because he wasn't very good. I know that On Her Majesty's Secret Service is now considered, like, one of the better, like, Bond I enjoyed films. it. To the, to the extent of, um, like, Christopher Nolan, it's, like, one of his, like, not favourite Bond films, but just one of his favourite films ever made. To the extent that the ending of Inception, which is all the Snow Fortress stuff, is basically a send-up to On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Which is, funnily enough, how this section begins with... Probably my favorite bit of the game, apart from the apart from the little bit of fun that they give you at the Emma Moon Racket, which is basically a recreation of not only the beginning of that film, which is like this kind of ski chase where you're trying to avoid uh, Spectre members, but also 
it is a recreation of the first level of Modern Warfare 2, which also ends with a, like, a skidoo section where one person's, like, driving the ski thing and you're shooting at guys who are, like, all around you. And again, like, Modern Warfare 2 probably wouldn't have had that section if it was not for the film on Her Majesty's Secret Service. So it's so this like, was definitely um, a Creative Liberties area because the scene I think that's supposed to represent yeah. is Bond, after being discovered and having his cover blown, mm-hmm. runs from the base and he's on skis and he's got guards chasing him also on skis. Um and then he flees into a town at the bottom and then happens to run into Tracy. They hop in a car and, and they leave. Whereas in this version... Uh, Him and Tracy are like on holiday skiing. That's what the setup yeah. seems like. Yeah. They're on the slope together. He proposes. Um, and then Blofeld's guides turn up for mm-hmm. reasons. And yeah, she, but- she goes off on the snowmobile and you're following on the ski. So it's like, all right, you've 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 switched that around a fair bit. <laughs> yeah, and it kind of changes the tone then to almost making Blofeld less of like... You know, I mean, obviously Bond's a thorn in his side, but like mm. Blofeld's entire thing is, I'm an international businessman, and like I want to do bad shit. Whereas in this, it's almost like I want, like I have a personal vendetta against Bond, and I want to stop him, which is really interesting to consider, considering that Spectre, when that film came out, that is also the backstory that they gave to their version of Blofeld. Oh, okay. Because yeah. certainly by the end of Her Majesty's Secret Service, Blofeld is personal. Oh, um, of course it is, yeah. Yeah, but throughout a lot of that film, it's uh, he's sort of like, you're annoying, and yeah. I'm going to do away with you, but I'm not taking you as a serious threat. Um, no. It's only when James sort of escapes his uh, sort of impromptu cell and starts skiing away down the mountain, he's like, shit, boys, get after him. Boys, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so you do a ski section. And yeah, this was fun. Uh, I didn't mm. die on this, funnily enough. I managed to do this in one, um, despite the fact that I was kind of like, oh shit, you're asking me to... I'm moving at like light speed and you're still expecting me to shoot stuff. No, it, it, it works. It works in a way that the driving sections and the rest of the game, in my opinion, don't really work that well. But this one works pretty decently, I thought. Uh, I only made three notes on the skiing section. I oh, was fine. not as successful as you. Okay. Um, my notes say, and I didn't double check with you, like listening to past episodes and stuff like the Red Faction one, swears seem to be fine, um, yeah. which probably tells you what my notes are going to be. Uh, fun this. twist on the ski escape from the film. That's one. The next that's one nice. is, fuck me, shoot the helicopter, lose Teresa. Chase Teresa, get killed by the helicopter. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the third and final note for the skiing section is I can't tell if this is a bad game or I'm just bad at playing it oh no this is a bad game like, don't, don't worry yeah, I, I think I, I, like even at the beginning of the episode is like yeah this didn't have um, this maybe needed a little bit longer in the oven which it didn't get unfortunately but again I kind of think that kind of goes to the fact of like they only had like a year to make this, but they still mm. had to do the Eurocom Bond game stuff. Of, well, obviously in this section, we're going to do a completely new gameplay style. And then in the next one, we're going to do... It's like, no, like you could have just made like a... I mean, this isn't a long game. This is something like four or five... Well, it was probably five hours for me because of how much I was dying, but like, I think six, it is only about yeah. four hours. It's, it's, it's not super long. I just, I don't know what, what bastard put accelerate on L2 for the ski? Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. No, that's that's fair enough. <laughs> that's break <laughs> in anything yeah. else. It's break. That's true. Um, and it's funny then because you try to catch up with the helicopter and then the helicopter gets away, but then mm. you and then it cuts like there's not even much of a cut, and then you're just on a helicopter and it's like, what? Okay, cool. Um, and then going back to my analogy of like, okay, Crash Bandicoot. So in most levels, you're, you know, you move by your own speed. And then in some levels, you're also running. It's like, okay, what can we do with an FPS game where we're not fundamentally changing the controls, but maybe we're adding, maybe we're removing one thing to create a different tempo. Uh, turret section. 
uh, you're on the helicopter and the helicopter's just doing big circles uh, and you pull out the machine gun on the heli and you just start ripping away and it's like, this is fine. Is this it is an okay. FPS if you haven't had a minigun section? Uh, that's true. And also if you haven't had a helicopter section. I don't know how many... I definitely know that when we did Blood on the Sand, that also had a heli section like this. Yeah, I think... I want to say that every game on Bullet Sand that we've covered, either you fight a helicopter as the boss fight or you do a helicopter turret section. I feel like that is... Even, think, I'm just now thinking of the fact that like you could have an absolutely perfect game, but the moment you put a helicopter turret section in, that knocks like two points off. That takes a game from a ten to an eight. Is if it has a helicopter turret section in it. I think spec up the line even opens with that. It genuinely does. Yeah. yeah. God. But also, uh, uh, Blofeld's HQ. Like as much as I did not get along with the skiing section, Blofeld's HQ is where the game. Um, sort of did a 180 in my mind and interesting i loved that shotgun it's become one of my favorite video game shotguns <laughs> huh. funny i i yeah i i thought it was okay i mean i think the stuff that i was getting a bit more interested in was all the kind of set pc stuff that wasn't shooting i think after the goldfinger section it all kind of moshed together for me except for uh view to a kill uh, not view to a kill um license to kill but i mm. guess we'll get to that when we get to that but yeah blowfield's base is it was okay um it had interesting architecture in it which hey if you're an fps arena shoot a game good thing to have so uh, yeah it's another one of those where i think this is again it's the most recent bond film i've sat down and watched and it was only about a fortnight before playing the game where i was like mm. i see how they've kept the original aesthetic but modernized it to blend it with you know the craig era um actually the the layout the colors the the sort of point and shoot nature of that shotgun was just especially with the very generous auto aim was just yes god i felt more like rambo or robocop than (laughs) than you did james bond i guess that's fair I was having fun, and I think it was the oh, first time throughout 007 Legends that my brain read just said, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> yeah, no, because I was thinking as well in regards to, like, what would I say is, like, the complete, what what is the bar that you have to clear as an FPS game to be considered, like, pretty good? And mm. I would say that, like, for bullet time, 007 Legends is maybe that bar in regards to, Ooh. if you can clear 007 Legends, you're you're in the clear. You're at least a 7 or an 8 out of 10. If you're not as good as Double or 7 Legends, you are, you are you know, see me after class. That is, you know... It, Your parents it dropped you to... several times as a baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'm just trying to think of anything interesting. I mean, there's the bit where you go to Blofeld's office to scan stuff, and then hmm. uh, in a twist, he... A book foot case like clears out and he's behind glass and then he fills the room full of gas right yeah so this this was a low and a knock against the entire section because i'm now yeah. i've got my smartphone out arkham style looking for ways to disable the gas or escape and the solution is to and this annoyed me as well i shot the glass i tried that but you have to shoot that glass so many times that i was like oh obviously that's not the solution then it just cracks it doesn't break um and in the end i did look this one up online and i was like yeah yeah i did the same thing (laughs) and i immediately said fuck off i shot the glass i shot and and even once i do the solution i was there like is this thing gonna break this is a shotgun is this thing gonna break and when it eventually did break all i had to say was finally thank you (laughs) yeah I'm surprised they didn't have, like, Tracy on the radio say, so shoot the glass or something, or, like... Mm. Or even if they did introduce breaking glass as a mechanic earlier on, because I don't think you can do that in, like, Blofeld's base, like, shoot any of the glass out. Um, so you can... You can shoot the glass out, because the whole building looks like a goddamn greenhouse in some ways. Sure. But it doesn't really do anything, you know, you can... Yeah. Uh, you can vault to the outside walkway and vault back indoors, but really that's just useful for cover every now and then. Yeah, no, exactly. yeah. That, that, that's about all it is. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else on this. I mean, you you abseiled down a cable car and then have the world's stupidest wee box and fight with uh, Blofeld. <laughs> but... Yeah, so that was surprising in that 
that is a bobsled race in the film. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, and then he sort of Blofeld ends up not quite impaled on a tree, but certainly stuck. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's it's just this weird thing where in because spoiler alerts, Blofeld doesn't die from that. Yeah, um, funnily enough. Yeah, and we could tell like in the film when he reappeared, I'm like, okay, fair enough. In this, he falls from God knows how many feet in the air from this cable car. And I'm supposed to believe that he survives that. I mean, I guess you don't really see who shoots Tracy, so you don't think it's Blofeld, right? It could have just been his guys or somebody else's guys, but... I could have sworn it was him. <laughs> uh, I, may, I, I can't remember. Like, I remember Tracy getting shot, but I don't think he... Because I think it's like, oh, you've seen the film, you know what happens in this bit. I don't think you... I, I can't remember if you see who shoots her. So in the film, you definitely see... In the see, film, you absolutely do, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not even Blofeld. Blofeld's driving, and it's his... Um, I forget her name. Frau something. Um, Frau for, for business from um, Austin Powers. <laughs> Might be who that character in Austin Powers is based Probably on. Probably is, think, yeah. yeah. But she's she's the gunner, and Blofeld's driving. Um, right. I could have sworn in this it was Blofeld... Um, doing like a GTA style drive by, you know, driving and shooting. <laughs> but, but they kind of, they, they miss the most potent part of that scene from the film. Which is the, yeah, which is the, the people coming over and them just, and them just being like, just, can you just let us be? Can you just leave me be for a minute? Like give him the time to sort of process what the fuck is happening. But no, yeah. not in this. Boom. <laughs> Felix's wife's dead in Jamaica. Yeah, it sort of just jumps ahead and said, it was like, it just needed that moment of quiet. Just that few seconds of lingering. Um, you yeah. know what, though? It's because you don't see a lot of the CGI Daniel Craig that they use. You do see him when he proposes to Tracy on the slopes. And it does it in the funniest way possible. Like, I always love when they do this in FPS games, because... I know in the Golden Eye, uh, in the Golden Eye remake, they had to keep this of the camera flying into the back of his head, but they do it in a bit of a cleverer way. But this does the thing of like when you're in first person, it's fine. But then the moment it goes to a cutscene, it's almost like the camera continues moving, but you're stuck in place, and then the camera comes into place so it can look at you and what you're doing, and then it slowly goes back to first person view again. And it does that with him and Tracy, and I just was like, God, that was a bit of an awkward movement, but fair enough. But the reason I say that is like, yeah, maybe the, the model probably didn't have enough detail in it to have conveyed Bond being sad that Tracy died, I guess. Yeah, the rig for, the facial rig anyway, seemed very mm. static. Like, we get a super close-up of the face model right at the very start of the game when you've got the, obviously, the golden woman dead on the bed, and he picks yes. up the phone goes right in on that face model and there is no like there are botox patients with more expression <laughs> yeah it is it, it, like somebody wearing a daniel craig mask for like lack of mm. it. So it was probably the model that they built for the wii version it was like well this would never have to be hd and then like a year later i was like hey can we get a ps3 version of this oh shit yeah okay you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that was it. Just another corner they had to cut because of the timelines. Oh, probably, yeah. No, I wouldn't be surprised if it is the... Which, hey, I, I'm a fan. I mean, the Yakuza games, you know, if, if you can reuse models between games, absolutely nothing wrong with that, as long as you then compensate by doing other stuff. This is, this is a game that just reuses stuff across the board. Apart from, I mean, I guess it's interesting then, sort of, um, License to Kill. Mm. Um, I haven't... I have seen this film, but I can't remember a ton about it. I know that... Uh, Benicio del Toro is in it. And that's about it, and he's of, and he's in this as well. Obviously, they couldn't get him as a voice actor because he would have been far too expensive. But the character's model is based on him or how he looked in that film. Um, okay, but yeah, you so this to, uh, is you have an advantage over me on this one because this is one of the Bond films I've yet to see. Okay, well, I know that there's an nice Aztec Temple bit, but anyways, so the wife is dead, and then mm. Felix, and then he's like, "Oh, go get revenge, you Felix." Boom. Cuts to another helicopter. Woman from the CIA riding the helicopter who's then like, okay, I'm going to sneak off and I'm going to do a deal with the bad guys. That's going to be my in. But mm. you need to sneak in. It's like, okay, how am I going to do that? 
Well, they're all roaming around this big ass Aztec temple, which is what the secret base is underneath it. In this level, we're going to give you a sniper. And now it's turned into when you got the sniper in Far Cry. Easy mode. You stay by here and you just bam, you're dead, bam, you're dead, bam, you're dead. And spoiler alert, keep hold of that sniper rifle. Yeah, never get rid of the sniper rope. Keep it for as long as you can. You are going to need that at the end. <laughs> yeah. So this kind of felt a bit like they almost try to make each kind of film, like, or at least they had the idea in their mind of, oh, each film's going to kind of have its own identity. Goldfinger's going to be a mix of everything because that's our intro one. And then um majesty secret service is going to be a bit more like set pc we're going to have like the stuff at the beginning but then which is going to have like a classic you know golden eye style arena style level this big old sniper's alleys and kind of long kill zones and stuff like that dying of a day is all social stealth and then it's all driving and then with moonraker it's fun don't worry about it we're gonna have some fun at the end um well, you have to have yeah, some fun at some point in this game, Chris. Yeah, you'll definitely have some fun at some point. Um, yeah, I didn't mind this section too much. I mean, granted, I have made notes about it, but I also feel like my memory is failing as I try and remember this game. But I remember the sniper bits because I just mm. like, oh yeah, no, here's just an opportunity to clean shop. And it's funny because it's like, this isn't a bad FPS thing, but like every FPS game suffers from this is that the moment you get a sniper, in the single player game, when you have a sniper rifle, it just breaks the game. Like, completely. oh, immediately. There's no challenge at that point. No, exactly. No. And th- this is the same would, thing. But yeah. I think I would disagree with every film trying to do its own thing or something. Different. No, I think like, that was the I- that that was probably the idea they began with. But then, uh, okay. a- as the game went along, they sort of forgot about that. Yeah, because it seems to, uh, a license to kill is probably where it becomes the most noticeable. Is there's this rut of sneak into the base or as i often did just shoot everybody shoot into the base yeah uh do the investigation in the big bad's office yep and then big raid and sometimes a vehicle section it was just sort of that five times in slightly different settings and it was like okay um like you i didn't have many notes about uh the first part of license to kill anyway um other than when you have to plant the bombs, I think that's the first time you pull a, a grate off the wall and go through the vents. I wrote, oh, how very oh. Arkham. Well, I was going to say, very diehard, which funnily enough, licensed ah. kill when, because these are all the Bond films they were doing in the 80s. And it's weird because people always go, oh, because Craig was their attempt to like make it a bit more realistic and gritty. No, they did the same thing with Dalton, because at this point, <laughs> the more stuff had become so mad, like towards the end. So and like, cookie. you know, the 70 year old man with an obvious toupee on like trying to do action scenes they went no we got to do something a bit darker and die hard had come out in 84 and then i think license to kill came out in 85 and they were like no this is sort of the more like our guy's still working for mi6 but he's going to be a little bit more hands-on and it's going to be mm. a bit more like one man against the world and so yeah you going through great so it's just like oh die hard influence neat but but yeah, also Arkham. I, I mean, Arkham is kind of diehardy. It's uh, you know, there's a guy in a lot of room scenarios. So. Yeah, I think this is something that um, they forget is that you know, in a in certain Bond films, like one or two guys with a couple of guns is still a big threat. You know, you're taking. He's on, a human being. Yeah. Like, yeah. Whereas this is like, here's a room with like forty guys. Don't worry about it. Or just bish bash bosh our way through there. So it's like he's not he's not fucking invincible. <laughs> no. And that's the Call of Duty problem. Is that mm. like they started off as these kind of well, it started off as like Medal of Honor, but like the funny thing with the original Call of Duty was they wanted to make more grounded Medal of Honor. And so you had all these kind of Ken Burns style letters, you know, letters to home of you know, the missions themselves were based on stuff that actually happened on the front line. But then you get to modern warfare and they're like, well, <laughs> what's our inspiration for this? And rather than going for like, well, what does actual modern conflict look like? Which they did to an extent, like in regards to the weapons and the tactics. But it was more kind of like, you know, 
Fox News made for television style, you know, raid on Al Qaeda base. You know, it looks like an action film because that's like how all of the news has been told at the time. So it's like well, glorified. Yeah, if we yeah. yeah, if we're gonna if it looks like action films, then why don't we just make ours an action film? And then by the time you get to Modern Warfare Two, it is as Yahtzee famously put it, Bond goes to war. And then <laughs> war goes to Bond with uh, Goldeneye Reloaded and Quantum of Solace. So. That's weirdly full uh, full circle. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I was en- enjoying myself for a good while. I did that that opening temple section. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went into the, the next bit and set all of the bombs. Uh, and then my notes say, word for word, oh shit, a mandatory stealth section, just as I was starting to have fun. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> this this level which feels like it's a big stealth section because of the sniper but then yeah they force you into a mandatory one and they were like oh no this bit this is the only bit that's stealth and it's like mm. this is stupid this sucks uh, and not that. only that but like narratively guys i'm pretty sure i know i'm here by now <laughs> yeah exactly like what's the benefit like what that the woman could be in trouble i guess but... mm. the secondary objective was weird as well i did it by accident um, so I was, I was trying to keep an eye on a few of these as we went along and die another day I'll, I'll get to as it just, I absolutely failed that and laughed my ass off. But this one was like, take down the four terrorists and at no point did I identify them. I was just going through, you know, room to room, shooting the people I needed to shoot and I knocked them off and every now and then it just came up in the corner, like one out of four, two out of four. I was like, oh, I guess that guy was one of the terrorists. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew? cool i guess um you do another we punch out session with a benicio del toro guy and you throw him into the gears like you do in the film but you don't actually see him go into the gears you just hear it happen off screen i guess it's a bit weak they had to save the budget somewhere i guess they they had the they had the money to buy a sound pack you know that that was that was all they had left in the coffers at that point i guess it was um it's weird because you you do that then you run through uh, rooms that you had to do the mandatory self sections in, only this time it's fine to shoot everybody. And then Pam's trying to get in the helicopter, and it's yeah. at this point you're you're up top by a button that you need to open some doors for her, and she's getting shot at. The helicopter's getting shot at, and I realised it's a good thing I kept the sniper rifle from forty two minutes ago. Well, um, I was going to say, at this point, I had an infrared sniper, which I can't remember if I picked that up or whether that is what we started with, because it was like, oh, this has made the sniping even easier, because it's literally, oh, dull gray background, but all the guys I have to shoot are bright white. Oh, mine so. wasn't infrared. Maybe I missed a, a sniper, because okay. I was like... Maybe I, maybe I picked something up on the way. I couldn't tell you where, but yeah, I had a nice big infrared sniper for this section, and... Well, it wasn't even infrared because it wasn't in colors. It was like a an infrared sniper that I had because yeah, you know, all the backgrounds were just grayed out apart from the guys who were bright white, which made it like super easy to hit them, which was nice. That's weird. Yeah, but the other thing is, I don't know if you can fail it because there were plenty of times where Pam was oh, like, yeah. "I'm taking fire," or the helicopter's taking too many shots, and like I'm pretty sure my ability did not improve. Uh, yeah. But she seemed fine. Yeah, the only section which is like relatively easy to fail is um, uh, trying to catch the pl- uh, trying to catch the heli in uh, on Your Majesty's Secret Service. For the most part, the protection stuff's pretty simple. Like, it's very hard to fail. Which I wondered whether maybe that was like a thing in the quality assurance stuff is that they came back and they said, "Oh, the, the, she's dying too easily." And I was just like, "Oh, just turn the health off. Don't, don't yeah. worry about." We'll just we'll bump that health up from fifty to nine 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 nine. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll we'll, say, we'll send it to minus one underflow. It's fine. The engine will know what to do. We'll Gandhi her. Yeah, there we go. Um, and then I don't can't remember how exactly you get to it, but then it ends with a driving section, which I guess let's do. We want to talk about the driving sections in this game and how they're not very good. Yeah, I found it weird that we went from a forty-two minute level, which good god by the end i was like thank god it's over oh to, so, yeah to like a four and a half minute level yeah like a, a five minute driving sequence and it's not even like at least with the dying of a day one like because we're in the brosnan era they're actually giving you like gadgets and stuff this is just pure driving and the driving itself is kind of like 
it's perfunctory. Like it does what it yeah. needs to do. I didn't particularly love it. You get but shot you should... at, you have some RPGs fired at you, and then you climb on top of a truck for a fist fight. That's yeah. it's it's over in the in the blink. And as I say, my missus was sat next to me while I was playing this. And when the level loaded up and it was a, a driving section, a bad one at that, she was like oh, they're doing this now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it's funny, like, they made this, like, wow, super exciting, you know, you're driving and whoa, well, this. But the fact that even, like, your missus is, like, looking at this and going, this is boring. Like, this is shite. Like, I'm sure she must have, like, when they did that in, I can't remember which Uncharted game it is where it has, I know there's a driving section in 4, which is kind of like that. And, like, the one in 4 is, like, super exciting because you're blasting through down muddy hills and through buildings and stuff like that. Has three got a driving section as well? Or oh, no, I think it is just four, right? There are two sections that come to mind from the first game. And the oh, first okay, one. Yeah. So you're you're driving away from the bad guy's base along like this rickety mountain road. Yeah. And Elena's driving, but you're on the back shooting. And then uh, does the does the jet ski bullshit qualify in Uncharted? Yeah, no, one? that's that's sort of a vehicle section. Yeah. God, what is it with Naughty Dog and just having shit jet ski sections? They invented it for Crash Bandicoot 3 and you went, oh, it was on the PlayStation, so they didn't know any better. And it's like, using the power of the PS3, you brought back the jet ski. And it's like, why? And There's no a guy them. somewhere who's convinced it's a good idea and just every game he goes, we're going to get it right this time. <laughs> you, there's a guy who's been at, who's still at Naughty Dog. He was there with the PlayStation who his entire thing is jet ski. When are we going to do jet ski? And the you know the next Last of Us is somehow going to have a jet ski section in it. Oh God, it is, isn't it? <laughs> Happy kids. Um, yeah. The thing with the driving section I didn't particularly like though is that the rockets all the RPG stuff all felt a little bit too like not magnetized, but it all felt like you couldn't really predict where they were going to land. No, and they sort of. They didn't seem to do much damage, but they did U-turn you. Uh, yeah, they fl- they they fuck your car around, which is the most annoying. Like you don't take damage so much, but like just getting fucking knocked about is really annoying. Yeah, it was like the amount of times I was like, "Oh, actually, the reverse might be just as fast as going forwards." Um, but just yeah, I think that's what I spent the most time doing was just swinging the car back around. It didn't seem to penalise me. I mean, I still did it first try with no deaths, so yeah. I did it. <laughs> and I took a lot of rockets. If that car had health, then it was, you know. Yeah. Uh, it um, might be like the Protect Pam thing where we're just like, oh, we'll just, we'll just turn that down. Yeah, we'll just turn health <laughs> off for this section. Yeah, yeah this will make it too hard. Um, and, then, and then, yeah, you punch a guy on a car. And then, because hmm. I'm trying to remember how that section particularly ends. Because then, so it you're t- you're on an oil tanker. The oil tanker flips. Yes. Then you have another punch up next to the oil tanker, and you um, the guy falls in oil spilling from the overturned tanker, and you you open your lighter and phew, you set the light. Yeah. God. Pretty brutal way to kill. I mean, obviously, I know that Roger Moore used to like should keep people and see absolutely shocking, but. Mm. I don't know, setting a guy on light, you know, setting a guy covered in petrol on fire is pretty, you know, insane. Well, they, they tried to set a theme through this one of, um, look, I know he killed your friend's wife, but, <laughs> um, so he, I think that one was for him. Okay, fair enough. That was, yeah. that, that was, that was the fun that he, that, that was the cheat that he got to have at the end of the, uh, the big adventure. Yeah. Um, which then takes us on to Dying of Day, which... I oh don't God. think this is the first Bond film I've ever seen. I'm pretty. I'm definitely sure it's probably the second Bond film that I ever saw because I didn't go to the cinema to watch it. Though the weird thing with the Bond films, and I guess it's because there was a big period of time because Die Another Day came out in '02, and mm. then um, Casino Royale came out in '08 or '09. I'm pretty sure. God, so I'd have been I'd have been about 13, 14 when Die Another Day came out interesting i think i was 11 when it came out i was in my gamekeep era when this when it came out which is the interesting thing with me is that when i think of bond i think of bond and star wars for me i think of them more in games than i do in films mostly because of the fact that there was a lot more bond games out when i was growing up 
than the mm. were Bond films. But then I did really like Casino Royale when it eventually came out, but I was like 16, 17 when it did. Um, and Star Wars was the same thing, because I know that the prequels were out, but the prequels weren't very good. This is... Jedi I, I remember good. seeing episode one in the cinema. I um, did too, and I didn't particularly enjoy it. I think I slept for it from what I have been told. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Fair. I think Sounds I was like awake. I had a couple of years on you. Um when it came out if you were 11 when die another day came out and i was 13 14 um but yeah darth maul was everything for a couple of years there oh no so i was awake for the pod race and then fell asleep and then managed to wake up do all of the fates so those are the only things you really need to see you didn't miss much of consequence in between those don't worry (laughs) but what i was going to say about the bonds is that so they weren't on there weren't a lot of films coming out but they went to itv and itv2 pretty quick after mm. they were in the cinema. Because I re- remember watching... Because Die, Die Another Day was like an ICV2 banger. Like, they would show it, like, multiple nights a week. <laughs> just like, hey, we've got nothing better to show, so you just die another day again. And so I've seen that film in a lot of chunks as a result. There is an entire middle section of that film that I cannot remember. But I can remember the North Korean stuff at the beginning. Him, in, him being tortured in prison while the Madonna song's playing getting out of the prison and John Cleese giving him the invisible car. Uh, Gustav Graves parachuting in with the um, uh, Union Jack uh, parachute. Blank, 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 blank. Him and Jinx to the Ice Hotel and everything that happens after that. Yeah, so we got... And this is uh, the running issue with these these adaptations is because they're doing and, five and then in the games is exactly the same thing where it's just yeah let's just start the ice hotel as the more interesting stuff yeah we start at the end and this this is where i get some of my films confused but die sure. another day is that the one with halle berry yes which was the thing that i was about to mention now which is so in this game because they couldn't get um uh halle berry's uh likeness rights they went with a different actress and rather than hiring an actress which looked like Halle Berry, they went with an actress who doesn't look like Halle Berry. Now, according to the Mini Me video, um, which came out a couple of weeks before we're doing this recording, but he also, mm. funnily enough, did a video on Double or Seven Legends. And we're not ripping him off. Me and Sam were penciled in. We were going to do this before we even knew the Mini Me video was coming out. It would have been last wasn't... week if uh, my controllers hadn't been fucked. <laughs> That's true, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, we're both 007 fans and he was on the podcast when we did uh, Second Sight. So, you know, we're big fans of him uh, on Bullet Time. But uh, interesting thing that he noted was that there was a bit of trivia, which was the actress who plays Jinx in 007 Legends was apparently the first choice that they had for the film Die Another Day. But then... Really? Yeah, oh, so, yeah. But then apparently things changed and they ended up with Halle Berry. Another weird thing with this is that the guy who plays Felix in this game is not the guy who was playing Felix in the Daniel Craig films, who was also an African-American man in those films. So we Ah. have two instances in this game of whitewashing, which is very weird. I wonder if the Jinx thing, in terms of the film, is they approached someone else first and then some executive went, well, Halle Halle Berry is a name that will sell tickets. Yeah, no, I think because yeah, because I think because uh, what X Men had come out in '99 and the next two had come out. I think was coming out the same. Storm, yeah, yeah, had, yeah. was going to come out the same year as Die Another Day. So yeah, Halle Berry was just a massive name, and they probably even just saw it as a thing of Halle's interested in. You know, the Bond films aren't the most progressive thing in the world, so why don't we like hire a like a well known African American actress to kind of like you know. I mean, there's Bond isn't the most progressive thing in the world, which, fair, no. watching some of those old ones are very much of their time. But Yeah, Sean Connery, the, the master of misogyny. Yeah, work. Did, did This game having two separate instances of whitewashing, though, that is... Uh, it had escaped my notice, admittedly. Yeah. I'll put my hands up there, but uh, that's not okay, surely. No, and the Jinx one's interesting because I think they did a similar thing in GoldenEye Reloaded where apart from, like, so Craig's obviously Bond and Dench is obviously M because that's who they were playing those characters at the time. Mm. Uh, Alex Trevelyan's completely recast. It's no longer Sean Bean. It's just a TV guy. 
Um, Natasha is completely recast as well. Uh, sorry, Natalia is completely recast. Xena on her are also completely recast as well. And so I think it was just along this line of, well, we're going to get different actresses and actors for these roles. But mm. yeah, the fact that they didn't try and get somebody who was like Halle Berry is weird. But also the fact that, because the guy who plays Felix Leiter in um, Casino Royale and Quantum is um, uh, Jeffrey Wright, who's... I, I don't think you'd, you would recognize him if you saw him. Like the biggest thing that he did was he was one of the scientists on the TV series Westworld. But other than that, like Casino Royale was like a big deal for him. Okay. I feel like he probably would have done the game if you'd got him. So I don't know why they didn't. Yeah, it's weird. Because on the one hand, like you say, the Golden Eye remake, they're like, well, we're going to recast everyone anyway. But then. I mean, you mentioned Pussy Galore, but also um, let me come Richard to Richard Kiel's back as Jaws in this. On Her Majesty's Secret Service, that is Diana Rigg. I don't, yep. <laughs> I won't hear otherwise, you know. Yeah, that her. is Diana Rigg. <laughs> yep. Um, um, so it's odd that they would, they would pick out these characters and be like, nah. And to go back to Die Another Day, they got back Toby Stevens as Gustav Graves. Huh, yeah. Yeah, so not quite sure what they were why they picked and choose i mean obviously they couldn't have got guy back the guy who played goldfinger because i think he was long dead by the mm. time like this game came up but, like it's easy enough to recast him and then with blowfeld like again they hadn't got to specs here where they had the new blowfeld who was uh, christoph waltz like they had to do their own which is a guy who looks like old-fashioned blowfeld but like they just hired a guy to play him Yes, thinking of Her Majesty's Secret Service, that is Diana Rigg's face, but I think she was either no longer in the industry or no longer with us. Um, no. I think she I, I, I'm, she must have passed away by now. Just, whereas I... Yeah. Whereas yeah. I think that is Posse Galore, the... Um, what, what's, God, I said her name earlier, but I've completely yeah, forgotten. Ursula... Uh, Ursula Andress. I'm pretty sure go. that is a voice accent. If it's not, I know for a fact the Golden Eye Rogue Agent Pussy Galore's in that, and she is both modelled on and also voiced by uh, Ursula Andrews again. So, oh damn! Yeah, now Golden Eye Rogue, Golden Eye Rogue Agent will probably end up doing on the pod at some point, mostly because we couldn't stop talking about it when we did um, uh, the Free Radical episodes because. Mm. Time Split is Free was being made at the same time as a Golden Eye Rogue Agent, and all the guys at EA were fucking ring it, were telling them, oh, your game's fucking dog shit. Our game, Rogue Agents, is going to do that. Like, we're doing really amazing They're going to do stuff. the numbers. <laughs> yeah. And then it didn't. Yet, all the marketing budget was that they had for um, Time Split is Free because they thought it was going to be a guaranteed seller because TS2 reviewed so well. Didn't sell super well, but reviewed really well. Mm. They didn't market it that much, and they used that money to push Rogue Agent, which didn't end up selling. So, they so just double con- loss. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. a double O loss as a result. I mean, I actually, yeah, no, I'll save my uh, free radical story about uh, not totally related to this game, but sort of related uh, when we get there. But okay. um, it's a day every day, and you, yeah, you just begin at the ice party and. As a result, it's just mostly social stealth at the beginning. You can't do a lot of cheating, which fair enough. This is weird because it gives you the, the side objective here is to photograph five arms stealers. Right? Yes. And what I didn't realize is that if you follow Jinx and do the investigation of the bad guy's bedroom, which is all of about 10 feet away from where you start. Funnily enough. You immediately fail the photograph five arm stealers. So I wasn't even 10 minutes into the level. And it was like, well, you fucked that, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> good, good job. You failed the game. It was just like, oh, cheers. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Um, you do a tiny bit of stealth stuff there. Um, you, I, I forget in the film that there's like a biodome. And I was like, oh yeah, of course there's a biodome. Because I remember there's bits where like they're in a jungle. And I was like, I thought this was in the Arctic, and then I remembered, oh yeah, there was just a biodome in the Arctic where they had a jungle, which, okay, fair enough. And then again, they do, much like in the film in this game, oh, a different biome that we can, like, do some action in for a minute. We could do some sort of shooting in a jungle. You see, in terms of, 
I, I get that's contrived for the movie, but in terms of like video gamey environments, that yeah. was a spot on video gamey environment. I really enjoyed the biodome. Yeah, uh, no, I did too. I, I, it reminded, it made me think of like how in Goldeneye, like even though it was based on that film, they had like a bunch of little arenas that were based on other Bond films just because they mm. wanted to fit it in. And yeah, that felt like, yeah, we can just have a contrivance for. Yeah, you've been doing a lot of snow sneaking, but hey, let's just have a jungle level for a second. It's like, yeah, cool. That works. I'm a fan of that. It didn't even seem that disconnected because the ice hotel is over in in about five minutes. Then you're outside for Mm -hmm. another short section and then bam, you're in the biodome. And even on the way back at the end, the biodome, you know, you go through a door and suddenly you're up a staircase and you're back in the ice hotel. So they were were really close together. Um, Yeah. But I did, this is where I made the note of saying, this is kind of blending together now. Um, Mm -hmm. But I also made the note, specific because the the guns seem to be tied to each film. The guns don't seem to recur. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got a note here. This machine gun, Strata, question mark, is absolute pish. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, the assault rifles in this game don't feel right. It is mostly... I mean, the pistols are pistols. Like, as long as you just make them accurate enough, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, the shotguns feel decent. The snipers, they don't feel anything, but it's just like having a sniper in a game is just good to have. Just it's like it's a tick good. sheet. There you go. Sniper. Yeah, no. Yeah, you have to have all the guns because it's like it's an FPS game. Um, there was one assault rifle I liked. It was uh, Tress something. Uh, I'm sure it had a number in it as well. Tress something three. Right. Uh, Christ, what was the name of that gun? And that had a couple of variants. Like, I found it with an ACOG scope and a, a couple oh, of other yes. different attachments. And that, that was pretty fun. I didn't mind, you know, blasting away with that. That was... God, what was the name of... I might even have to look up the name of that gun. Oh, that's <laughs> fine. I mean, I'll kind of say as well while you're looking it up. Um, this game does have a, you know, speaking about guns and gun feel, this game does have a multiplayer mode. Um, neither of us uh, played it for this episode, most of just because of the fact that, one, all the time we mostly look at campaigns because, you know, that's usually the more interesting thing. That was what a lot of FPS games were iterating on from Halo and Call of Duty. And two, I don't even think there's servers for this game anymore. So if you wanted to play this, it had to be in, like, couch co-op which was going to be kind of logistically hard to pull off. Um, so for, for any... I could have potentially done some local multiplayer, but um, the only the only willing participants in the house were not willing. Uh, no, I, uh, yeah, they, they would be forced couch co-op very much so. Yeah, they did, they did not want any part of that. Um, yeah. it, it's one of those things where, like, if there's, and admittedly I've done this a few times with the kids, where like, if there's a, a kind of shitty game, but you know what, I do need the, um, what do you call it? The, footage. Some, yeah, the footage for a review or something. Can usually talk the kids into a bit of co-op or a bit of versus, but even they took one look and were like, nah, you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> they, they saw they saw five minutes of Bond, and well, they saw five seconds of Bond and just went, Yeah, and they're one. The oldest is eleven, and the youngest is nine. And sort of even at even at that age, they're like, "Yeah, no, we'll we'll pass on that one, Dad. You you have fun." Ah, here it is. The Terra Light Three. That was the gun I was thinking about. Fair enough. Yeah. Sounds like a modern gun, which makes sense because Die Another Day was probably the most modern. Film I don't think the Terra Light Three featured in the Die Another Day section, but that was. That was actually quite a satisfying assault okay. rifle to use. And then we got this strata thing for die another get day. And I was like, fucking, I may as well be going up to them and tickling them with a feather. This is... Yeah. Uh, this game does have um, the classic FPS, you know, bullet time thing of, oh, if you crouch and if nobody's looking, if you sneak up on them and you press in one of the sticks, you just karate chop them and knock them out. So if you want, if you don't, if you can get away with it and if you don't can't be bothered to do any shooting, you can just go around just karate chopping guys. It's great. So that was inconsistent. So sometimes I'd yeah. sneak up on a guy and I'd press R3 and Bond would do sort of like this longer takedown animation. 
Um, like they're like, fucking hell, we're going to get seen doing this. We can go put a coffee on, shall I? Jesus. Um, and then there were other times where instead of doing that long drawn out animation, he just did the normal melee whack animation and they fell down like it was bloody Halo 3. Yeah. I have no idea why sometimes it was this long drawn out pre-baked thing and other times it was just crack. Yeah. It, yeah. Very, very inconsistent. Um, speaking of inconsistent, I'm trying to remember, like, you have the biodome, then you have outside. How do you get to the room where Jinx is being held, like, in the glass room below you, and then Gustav's wearing the stupid electricity suit like he's, um, Vulcan? Um, so you, you go through the biodome, and then there's a big gleaming office at the end of the biodome, which you go into, um, and then you have to fight... So Jinx is strapped to a metal table, and there's like, lasers yeah. 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 around there. Yeah. And then you have a fist fight with, uh, what's his name? Diamond Burn Face. face. Yeah. D- Diamond Man. Diamond Man, who you think is the guy who gets blown up at the beginning of the film, but then it turns out that Ghost of Graves was actually him, who had facial reconstructive surgery, and they made him a white guy. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was about to say these Bond films, you know, the, the Bonds, not a very uh, forward-thinking franchise. <laughs> no, um, oh. different woman in every port is Bond. Yeah, um, speaking of which, actually, and we haven't mentioned this yet. I mean, we talked a tiny bit about the presentation in regards to the graphics, which, uh, actually, yeah, no, I'll say my piece now, which is kind of like with Eurocom. Hmm. I think they're very much a developer who. And we talked about this a little bit when we talked about Free Radical, but very much when we were talking about Haze was that the HD era wasn't, like, very kind to a lot of, like, really great AA developers. And Eurocom, I think, is a good example of that, of they started in the NES era, did some decent snares stuff, but then the N64 and PS2 eras are, like, where they basically made their bread like because there Mm. wasn't like even though like visually it was a massive leap between those two consoles you went from characters who could only be made with like out of a hundred triangles to allow like nearly a thousand to ten thousand so like you could make some like bond on the n64 looked like a guy with a sock over his face versus in nightfire where for all intents and purposes that looks like beers brought like you know blur it a little bit and it looks like beers brosman See, I always get hung up on those as well because I can't. Re- I always think it's Agent Under Fire and then Night Fire, but I, I could be wrong on that. So it's Agent Under Fire, which was done by EA Redwood, I think. And then it was Night okay. Fire, which was done by Eurocom, and then Everything or Nothing, which then went back to EA Redwood, who then yeah. ended. Um, what's it called? Uh, From Russia with Love. Okay. It's funny that, like, when it went from EA to Activision, Activision was still like, oh, a Eurocom of the Bond? Well, they're the, they're the solid hand that you get in to do a Bond game. And it's funny because it was, like, always the bridesmaid, never the bride thing of that. Apart from this, like, when they did GoldenEye for the Wii, mm. that was, like, that wasn't the only Bond game that came out that year or at the, on, like, that date. Because also Bloodstone came out, which was done by the Bizarre Creation guys. And I think that that was treated more as like, well, you know, you get Goldeneye for the Wii because, you know, the Wii needs something. But no, Bloodstone, yeah. that's our big ticket game for this, you know, financial quarter. And Bloodstone didn't do very well. Like, it, it reviewed okay, but sales-wise did pretty poorly to the extent that they ended up closing Bazaar down. Because between that, like, that and Blur did pretty badly, like, cr- like pretty badly commercially. Mm. Um, whereas with Goldeneye, because it was made like on a double A budget, because it was a Wii game, and because it was fucking Goldeneye, it made like bango bucks for Activision to the extent of hey, why don't we put this on the PS3 and the Xbox 360 just to soak up some extra sales? Yeah, tart it up a bit, some nicer textures, and yeah, and then you get to Legends, which is like, hey, could you try and make this game on a triple A budget? But you genuinely do need to work in the HD era now, and like graphically. I don't know, like, I would call the graphics functional. Like, they're not particularly pretty looking. Like, this came out in 2012, which was, what, the year before uh, The Last of Us, which is, like, you know, the PS3's, like, high watermark and, you know, stuff like uh, Bioshock Infinite or whatever. But even in 2012, yeah, it's pretty decent looking. I mean, 
Arkham City and Arkham Asylum were like way better than uh, 007 Legends did, and they were probably built, made on similar prices, I would have guessed. See, I wonder about that, because I suddenly I thought the graphics were passable. I thought yeah. the performance was actually surprisingly stable for a PS3 title, but hmm. uh, you, you mentioned Arkham City there, and for the video I put out recently, I tend to do a version comparison, and the PS3 sure. is how I represented that generation of consoles. And it is amazing to me how much the jump from the PS3 version to the PC version is just about getting that cleaner image at a higher resolution with some anti-aliasing on it. Um, I sort of wonder how transformative the PC version of Arkham City is compared to its PS3 counterpart. Mm -hmm. What a PC version of 007 Legends would look yeah. like um the wii u would have also been an interesting thing as well because it's like because the ps3 was always despite the fact that it was like the most powerful console of that generation usually got the worst games like the like bayonetta mm. on the ps3 is like unplayable like it runs in the single digit frame rates and it's literally because they said we can't programming for the ps3 is like really difficult which is bizarre considering that the 360 and the PS3 are built on similar archi- like similar specs and similar architecture. They're both power PC. So. so there was a lot of horsepower in the PS3, which rarely got used, and that's why we were lucky to get 720p30 in a lot of games that came to PS3. Yeah. But yeah, it seemed to be if it was multi-platform, and this is a sweeping generalization that may sure. annoy the comment section, but generally the Xbox 360 was the lead platform, and then, oh, we're going to port that over to the PS3. And if the PS3 wasn't in the consideration from the start, it usually ended up with sort of like the sloppy seconds or that port being an afterthought. But when you got like, stuff like Uncharted or Resistance yeah. or Killzone or uh, The Last of Us, as you mentioned a moment ago, that was built with that machine in mind and they knew how to work it, oh, you could get some stuff out of that. Speaking of Sissy, and I think as well is that, like, that was the generation where Unreal Engine, I think, became, like, a lot more important to sort of the backbone mm. of a lot of AAA games. And it just never played nice for the PS3, from what I understood. Like, they basically tuned Unreal 3 and Unreal, like, Unreal 3 especially around the 360, so... So I dug into, because I didn't have access to the Xbox 360 version of City when I was doing sure. that version comparison... Um, the next best thing I thought to do would be to look at uh, Eurogamer's face-off coverage of it, which is yes. essentially Digital Foundry before Digital Foundry. Mm. And they concluded that the two versions were, um, about some, some high-level things about the amount of audio channels available and such, um, that the PS3 and 360 versions of Arkham City were more or less indistinguishable. That's pretty good. Yeah, and that is, that's Unreal 3. So it's sort of one of those things of, like, it can be done. I just think that the yeah. PS3 was, you know what, we don't sell as many copies because there's a lower install base. It's a harder system to work with. Fuck it was usually yeah. the attitude. Yeah. I think that was the thing with the PS3 as well, is that a lot of that engine, a lot of that big kind of processor grunt that they had, a lot of it was being used on stupid stuff like fucking... The, the console itself like running the um uh the xp uh the the cross media bar and like it was running stuff at the background because it was like oh you're also going to use this as a media center it's like you're not, not which is anymore. weird because microsoft are the ones who usually get criticized for trying to be an all-in-one media machine rather than just a games console i say this about every anytime anytime they become a console any person who becomes a console leader always then gets too high mighty and goes Actually, we're not a console anymore. We're going to put a PC in the living room. We're going to make this a media hub. Because, yeah, Microsoft won with a 360 era and so mm. became, oh, well, we're going to become the PS3 of the next generation. And they did it in regards to they completely bungled it. Whereas Sony were humbled by the situation and made it more of a dev machine. And the PS4, as a result, just kind of got off and away. And you could arguably say with the Wii, we did incredibly well. And a lot of that was driven by stuff like Netflix and nearly the you know, kind of YouTube stuff. So the Wii U became like a all-in-one media machine, which ended up fucking denting it. So once the Switch came out, they just completely stripped back on that. And now I wonder when they do Switch 2, 
are they going to get the wrong impression of oh every every you know the switch and store base is so massive oh we've got to turn this into an all we've got to put a pc in your living room and it's like no don't do that we've got to be a steam deck yeah mm, yeah that's a thing as well ps5 funnily enough kind of avoided that like it didn't get to up its own butt despite the ps4 being like the winner of the last gen so but then it has no. also hasn't got any games so so what I like about the PS5, and then I'll, I promise we'll return to yeah, no, no, this is a good driving tangent. on ice physics, <laughs> which yeah. is, oh boy. But the PS5 is sort of like, it's very clear that there is a, a game side and then you switch and all the media icons have their own screen. Yeah. And it actually does a, a smart thing because it is our Netflix driver as well. Um, mm-hmm. It's what we watch Crunchyroll and all our anime through is... If we fire it up with a DualSense controller, it will go to the Games tab and all the games will be displayed. But if we fire up using the PlayStation Media Remote, it ah, goes to the Media nice tab. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so. really, yeah, that's, cle- that's, that's a clever consideration. I like that. Hmm. God. Um, so we ended up on this tangent because we were talking about kind of the graphical quality of the game. The thing I was going to talk about was the music, which is okay. But the thing I was going to say was that, like, um, so looking it up, um, David Arnold, they were able to get him back, who was like a Bond composer guy from GoldenEye mm. onwards. He redid the GoldenEye theme in Reloaded, but then okay. he also recomposed all the Goldfinger stuff in this. Didn't do the rest of the game. They got a guy called um, uh, Kevin something to do all the music and the rest of this game. But for the most part, I would say that they bring back, they kind of like reinterpret all the themes in quite a nice way. Like when bits of License to Kill, you know, the birder kind of come in and that section of the game is nice. I can't remember any bits from Dying of a Day coming in in this part. And I wonder whether that's because it was also a Madonna pop song, which might have still been in like, a like at least with the Bond. Hell. Yeah, yeah like at least with the bond songs they were written like pretty much foremost as bond themes whereas with mm. dying of a day i think that was like on a american pie album and stuff like that so you may as well yeah. have gotten britney spears toxic or something it would have made yeah they should mm, they very much should have um yeah let's talk about ice driving this bit sucks yeah the, the only thing i was gonna say on the music yeah, is sure. that because they had those motifs and those themes to to riff off of and because the bomb music is so iconic in the first place what i usually hate that word um i think that carried a lot of the vibe because mm-hmm. certainly i did not feel like a spy and i didn't feel like bond i didn't have the gadgets i didn't have the you know i was shooting far too many people um with far too loud weapons uh, f- to feel like bond but the music i was like uh oh, there's some bond that actually yeah. feels a little bond yeah i it's the one thing because i think the craig films kind of figured this out as well from like skyfall onward is that they brought back a lot of that sort of brassy sound which is very hmm. bond like this is golden eye hasn't got that at all because golden eye was like modernized to be less you know it was what it was the 90s at the time so it was a bit more kind of blockbustery had a tiny bit of the big brass but not as like yet but it was with a tina turner sort of you know cooler tint to it Hmm. but then all the games like everything or nothing and nightfire like i don't remember any of the themes to those like everything or nothing is a lot more kind of electronic and matrixy sounding which is not like bond at all but then in this yeah like you know they could work in a bit of the brass which gives it kind of a nice yeah, it sort of does ground it a little bit, but then they don't have a ton of that in Die Another Day, but then I guess Die Another Day didn't have a lot of brass in it anyway, so... No, no, as you say, I think they'd gone for more of a contemporary, suave, uh, mm. you know, how do you do fellow kids sort of sure. take on it, which is is unfortunate, but we did at least get some, some gadgets on this car. That's true, you could shoot missiles out of your car, which was exciting. But then you had to drive on ice, which was like, yeah, you, you give, you take away. Well, the weird thing do- is, <laughs> I, I actually wrote, oh fuck, more driving, but with ice physics. And then underneath, oh thank god, they're giving us traction control. And then one final mm-hmm. note for that that says, which doesn't help. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> they, 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 they tease you with uh, traction control, but uh, not much. No. Um, the thing with this is that you have to try and goad the guy in the green jack to drive into the, 
the stupid gust of grave like um ice laser which she kind oh, of is that what was happening yeah like oh. i only yeah i only figured that out from the cut scene but like they're like oh you need to get in you need to push him into the laser and it's like i don't know how i can barely keep up with him but it turns out that all you had to do was just yeah hit him with missiles a couple of times and that was it well i i chased him the first time and i must have tagged him seven or eight times with missiles and I got a little cutscene and a mission failed. I was like, the hell did I do? So I reloaded. I did the exact same thing. And I got the, yeah, well done. You did it cutscene. You can <laughs> yeah. carry on with the game now. And I'm like, I don't know what I did differently. <laughs> no, it's just very hit and miss in what it flags is like, you did it correctly or you didn't. Like, driving on, you then, you go from driving onto the ice to driving on a. It, it, it's funny, I remember this, like, um, a Fast and the Furious film did this, and that's the version I remember rather than Bond, which I think they must have done it in Die Another Day as well, but you're then driving the car along a airstrip to try and get on the back of a big old cargo ship, which is where mm. Gust of Graves is, and you get on, and then you do wee boxing again, but with the stupid fucking electricity suit, man, which, well, this again... Is what th- just threw me, because every... every movie has been two levels up to this point yeah. right the ice hotel in the biodome was a level yeah then we did the driving and it gave me an end of level screen and then the plane although it's only another five minute section and bear in mind the driving was only about six minutes or so although the plane is only another five minute section that was treated as another level and i was like wait yeah. why does this one get free <laughs> i yeah, the how they calculate this stuff, I have no idea where they put the. I you know I imagine I wonder whether it was a loading thing because they had to move you mm. out of the ice racetrack onto this, I guess. But yeah, because it feels like I mean we've had some other transitions in location which have kept you in the same level. Yeah, um, but it very much felt like parts two and three were meant to be one and the same. Hmm. Yeah, it's odd. Um, but yeah, then you fight Gustav. And I was saying about this lease of my credence of this being a coma fantasy, where the more the game goes along, mm. the crazier it gets because Bond's brain is dying and he doesn't know how reality works anymore. Which is why this ends with electricity, man. And then why the next level is the most farcical Bond film of them all. Moonraker, a.k.a. James Bond in space. With anti gravity and everything. Oh, but they had. I mean, they had to do it. I mean, I mean, I would say, like, I feel like this is. If you've heard of 007 Legends, there's probably two things you know about it, which is Daniel Craig in a bunch of Bond films. They do Moonraker, and there's an anti gravity shooting section. Um, I will say, if you know that about the game, and when you get to the um, anti gravity shooting section, Eh, not as fun as you'd imagine it'd be. But then that's this game in a nutshell, which is eh, not as fun as you'd expect a Bond game to be, but hey I know, my, my overall takeaway from the game was, like, I did not have a, a seemingly negative thing about no. it. I think it had a, a few surprising highs, a lot of lows, but generally I walked away from it thinking, I've played worse. Yeah, no, I'm not. Yeah. I wasn't angry playing it, and I couldn't even say I was disappointed with it. I just kind of feel like it. It just sort of washed off me. Like that's the thing. I mean, the only thing yeah. I would say is, well, I, you know, I'll say it's a weekend rental. Oh, to, yeah. This is yeah. this is a this. If Blockbuster still existed, this would have been a. Well, I would say the most of the modern games kind of had that sort of Blockbuster magic to them as well, which makes sense as they were movie games. So. Uh, but I guess let's talk about this level beforehand. Which oh is, yeah, um, yeah. Let's not jump jump the gun. Uh, the, before you even go to space, you have to do some uh, base sneaking. You do another stealthy section, which uh, cool. The, the blast furnace escape was kind of fun. Yeah, uh, before you strange. do the before you do the uh, blast furnace escape, though, you fight Jaws, Richard Keel. Oh, you do. I remember when they were because when I. Because everything or nothing came out, and I want to say oh four or oh three, when I was either twelve or thirteen, and that was when I was like in my peak, like 
I had gone from reading N64 magazine and being like, oh, I know what games are. I'm going to make games by personality. At that point, I was into reading Edge. And I was like, oh, I'm a games expert. I think I'm a connoisseur of video games. And part of that was like watching game trailers and like, um, oh, this new EA game is coming out. Let's watch all the behind the scenes. Uh, And one of the big selling points that they had with uh, Everything or Nothing was that not only did it have, because Nightfire, I think, had like, it didn't even have uh, Piers Brosnan's, like, it had his likeness, but it didn't have his voice, but it had nobody mm. else. Everything or nothing, the big selling point was, boom, we're spending big EA money on this. We're going to have Brosnan doing the voice, Dench doing the voice, Cleese doing the voice. But then all of the other kind of extra characters were all cast from actual actors. So they had Willem Dafoe as the kind of the Bond villain in it, and Heidi Klum was in it as the Bond girl and stuff. But one of the big selling points was Richard Keel is back, is Jaws. 80-year-old Richard Keel at this point. Of course, he looks like he did in Moonraker when he was mm. in his like 40s or whatever. And the thing is, is that you don't even have to voice him because he doesn't have a voice. He just grunts. That's the shtick. But it's based on his likeness. And again, they do the same thing here. It's his likeness and... You fight him and you throw him into a big globe, but then he's not dead because then the guy from Moonraker walks out with Jaws and he's like, eh, throw you into the blast furnace. Yeah. So, yeah. It, was, it was fun to see him. Um, yeah. I don't know that you can have a Bond game without him because like, even he even turns up in the bonus levels for GoldenEye and stuff. You know, he's... Well, yeah, I mean, as, as we said earlier as well, like part of the reason why they put Goldfinger in this is that because of uh, Odd Job, like you mm. fight Odd Job, which is, I mean, because I'm because those two are going to be like the most famous Bond heavies, right? Because like Nick Knack from um, Living Like Die, like barely most people remember. I guess maybe um, what was Grace Jones's character called in um, View to a Kill? Christmas Jones or whatever. No, Christmas Jones is the scientist in Tomorrow Never Dies. God. You've lost me on that one. No, that's fine. But Grace yeah. Jones was also like a famous Bond heavy as well when she was in uh, View to a Kill, like, um, which, fair enough. Um, Yeah, I, I'm just trying to think of like famous Bond henchmen, but I guess those are like the big two. And like, so if you're doing a greatest hits of Bonds game, like you have to put them in. I guess, yeah, good that they pop, got managed to get both of them in and didn't recast them, I suppose. But I guess how could you? It would be a tall order. I certainly wouldn't want to try. No, absolutely not. Uh, um, but yeah, you escape the blast furnace. Um, you dress up in space costumes. You, well, I say space. You dress up in space suits to try and blend in. Doesn't fucking work because the next thing that happens is a bunch of guards catch you. And the girl knocks them out, and then you just go around shooting them. Which well, they, cool, they literally catch you as you're still changing into the disguise. <laughs> yeah, I know it's so lame. But... It's pretty much how most of my first runs of a Hitman level go. <laughs> yeah, no, it is very Hitman esque in that regard. Um, and then you just shoot your way through corridors, and then the you manage to get to the backup spaceship where the astronauts are about to get on, and you shoot them, and then you go into the spaceship. So it was when you emerged there that I first saw the Moonraker laser, and we spoiled this earlier a bit, but sure. that's where I was like, ah, oh, I fucking love this gun in gold, and I give me that laser, give me that, ah, oh, yeah, it's the- shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not very good. <laughs> Uh, uh, but then you've got s- uh, this again a helicopter indoors you gotta do it you gotta have a heli indoors why not god I don't know I was a, wasn't too taken with that that section at all really it was just sort yeah. of a went in one ear and out the other kind of deal and it's that weird there was one bit that stood out for the wrong reasons and it's when you're told, okay, get into the office by hacking the door and, and blowing the fuse box, which we've done before. Or I suppose yeah. activating the fuse box so that the doors will open. But this time, uh-oh, it also activates sentry guns. Now go down this other corridor to deactivate yeah. the sentries. And I, I think I verbally said out loud, I'll do one. <laughs> 
it's that it's the classic games thing where it's like, oh, we've run out of consent, so let's just take what we have and make it more convoluted. Let's let's just give you the run around. It's like that sucks. Yeah. Especially considering that this seemed like the level that they probably worked on first. Consider this is what they were showing off at E3 2012. Like it's oh, yeah. Okay. That this was the one that they showed off first, and they were like, well, you know, because Moonraker is obviously is one of the earlier films in the chronology. But then they decided as the it came out of production was like, no, let's save this to the end because like this is the one set piece that we actually figured out and made fun, which is yeah, you and Holly Goodhead go to space. And then when you're in the big arena, boom, the gravity turns off. Yeah, so I did. I added a. I asked a question out loud shortly after getting those spacesuits, um, and I think Thomas has just laughed. But <laughs> we change into these space suits. We're space suits, even we're immediately in a gunfight. I just said out loud, "Wouldn't a single bullet hole compromise the integrity of the suit?" <laughs> it's a fair point. Like, it seems incredibly reckless. <laughs> yeah, no. If anything, why yeah, why didn't you save the put in the suit son and see he got on the ship? Or maybe there's a scene of just where the like the rocket's about to go off and they're just covering the bullet holes with duct tape to try and like, there you go. This will see us. In the next part of the level, you've got not only the anti gravity sections, but you go for a spacewalk. You go out the yeah. airlock and round, and it's like yeah, we're all shooting at each other here, guys. I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> this is the funniest thing of just, like, just imagining Daniel Craig's Bond of just, like, oh, yeah, you're in the space. Yeah, there's just a, yeah, there's just a big space station up in our Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, don't, don't worry about it. This was built at some point between the years 2007 when Casino Royale came out in 2012. That's You've heard of the ISS? It's fine. Yeah, this is the ISS too. This is the evil. This is the ISS's evil twin. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Oh God! It's like angry reviewers who all had the anti personality. <laughs> yeah, that's the yeah that's the that's the ISS that forces the other ISS to play Sonic Six for the channel. Or those poor Russian. Or those poor Russian astronauts having to play Banjo Kazooie nuts and bolts for the week. Hey, you like that game. <laughs> I do, but that's the classic... I mean, I'm thinking of fucking John Tron, where uh, bloody Gruntilda forces him to play Nuts and Bolts, and he has to pretend it's a bad game, which it's not. It's a great game. See, I, I, for some reason, I went to Chris Bohr's Irate Gamer. Oh, well, what, so what was the Irate Gamer's... Like, what was his crypt... Like, what game was his crypt tonight? Oh, God. Because um... most people was Sonic 06, from what I remember. Yeah, I want to say it was like Gyromite or a Rob the Robot game. <laughs> and I'm just imagining that was probably because he had that game as the kid, as a kid but didn't have Rob. So he was like, what the fuck am I meant to do? This game's hard. Uh, as a whole era, it was like, I, he is the game dude. He is, he is so the game. Oh, I forgot <laughs> the game dude. I know it leaks of him. Anyway, yeah. I'm, I'm taking us way, way off. No, that's, that's fine. <laughs> we haven't got a ton left. I mean, yeah, you have the space... Sh I mean, the problem is just that I've pl I played this a couple of weeks ago, and, the, and so the for the space section, I was just like, oh, you know, you go outside, and it's, you know, it's big and cool. And, you know. I, I think this is the longest mission of the game as well, right? Um, If it was, it didn't feel like it. No, I think it's, I think the pacing of it's quite well, but the... Um, the bit beforehand's like relatively meaty, and then this bit like nice, like it lasts for quite a decent chunk as well. So, what's what's kind of embarrassing is the gravity gets turned off, and you have to go out uh, because you've got the marines coming to back you up. But mm -hmm. there's gun turrets. Oh no! Um, and you go out, and you're on like this little walkway, and there's a panel in front of you. And I'm like, okay, so how do I use this panel to disable these turrets? And no, the answer is there is a big gap in the walkway that you can float out of and you literally shoot these massive fucking turrets with a tiny little pistol. Oh, and yes. apparently that's enough to blow up the turrets. <laughs> it's very it's a very powerful pistol, you know? Uh, it took me an embarrassingly long time to work out what I was supposed to be doing. 
Yeah, like, again, instructional design brain is just kind of like, well, we didn't know that we could do space walks in this game. Like, could we just not got a little... Pro- You're giving me prompts mm. to say that press square to pick up a new gun. I know how to do that. But like you're not gonna give me a prompt to do do spacewalk. I was it was fucking bizarre. Um, <laughs> and, and even then, like the thing of I think it was just out of frustration and like trying to interact with this panel that wasn't interactive. Where I just went, fine, I'll just shoot the fucking thing. And then my brain went, wait, that worked. Why did that work? <laughs> <laughs> I was like shooting the glass earlier to um get the gas out of the room. Yeah, but at least the turrets had the good sense to actually respond and react. That's but, true, yeah. <laughs> versus the glass is like 10 shotgun shells later. How does this section end again? I can't remember. Uh, I wrote it down. Oh, thank um, you. I put, oh, that's the ending. Destroy a mechanical arm and pop Drax out the airlock. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. You just <laughs> knock Drax out the airlock. God. Yeah, it's like the final boss is just this machine that's trying to deploy poison pods. And you just have to shoot at the glowing red part of the machine to destroy it. Uh, Repeat that six times for six mechanical arms. And and that's it, kids. Final boss of the game. Congratulations. Congratulations. You've done all the 007 legends. And then... Yeah, Except do you, you wanna, haven't. Do you want to say what happens then, which is really funny in hindsight now that you can't get the DLC to this game? Yeah, so Trax goes out the airlock, and at this point I'm thinking, okay, so at the start of the game I got shot, mm-hmm. and this is like my life flashing before my eyes, so surely I'm now going to return to that moment or get resolution or, or something. No, 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 no. The credits come up, and the first thing they say is, James Bond will return in the free Skyfall DLC missions <laughs> coming out November 2012. I'm like, that's delisted. That's- yeah. <laughs> so, uh, funnily enough, mentioned in the Mini-Me video as well, um, the only way to now play this DLC is you have to buy the Wii U version, where the DLC was printed to disc. Which is why if you go to CEX, it's like £6 for the PS3 version or 30 for the Wii U. Uh, yeah, it is a, it is full whack for the free Wii version, which... Um, we I watched the Skyfall missions online. Don't look like a lot of fun. It looks like the worst parts from Skyfall. So. Ah. Yeah, which, to the, be fair, is a lot of Skyfall. Oh, Skyfall has some fun moments, like the bit where the guy gets eaten by the Komodo dragon. Um, it's mostly the bit where he's in the unfinished tower in Tokyo and he's having the fight with the guy and he's pushing him through like a lot of glass panels. They oh, okay. do that. So they like, still like cut to halfway through the movie and then just do the climax. Oh yeah, no. Well, I mean, because yeah. the first half of the movie is just him having a rest and then meeting Q and then learning about Harvey Abad and which you can't really turn that into an FPS section. Yeah, no, it's when he goes to Tokyo is when uh, uh, that's where the gameplay kicks in and that is it. From what I understand, that's like the only section of that DLC. Cool. Uh, yeah, so people like complain about, oh, Azur's Wrath and Final Fantasy Thirteen Part Two and Prince of Persia lock the real ending behind DLC, DLC and how dare they and preservation and this, that, the other. I never hear those people complain about 007 Legends in the same breath. No, you know what? You know what would have been better? Is that when it ends, the game just says, okay, now put in the disc for GoldenEye Reloaded. <laughs> and so then that becomes the next part of the game is since you play Golden Eye Reloaded. And that's another 007 legend, apparently. Or you put in the disc for 007 Golden Eye Reloaded and it unlocks the Skyfall levels like it's Banjo Kazooie's uh, swap shop. Oh, yeah. Or like um, Sonic 3 and Knuckles kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, God, see, there we go. Full of ideas, but. It's just um, crazy that they developed this on such a tight timeline and it had to release for a certain date that what's on the disc is incomplete because we get the entire framing device for the entire game is unresolved in the release day printing of that game. Yeah. And it's really funny is that it was a game that was meant to tie in with Skyfall and only the first few seconds of the game ties in with Skyfall. You need the DLC in order for the game to properly tie in with Skyfall. So. Insanity. Um, um, like, committed to disc, the only way to play it now is to buy the Wii U version, but judging how a lot of PS3 360 era games that got ported to Wii U perform, 
I would not want to experience this game on a Wii U. From what I understand, the Wii U version ain't bad. It yeah. doesn't. It runs at thirty, but it. But that's it. Like it, it. It is solid. It is competent enough. But I can believe that, considering that this was it was built on the engine that GoldenEye uh, Reloaded was, which I believe also got a Wii U port. So, huh. I, yeah. I might be biased because my most recent experience of a Wii U was Arkham City Armored Edition. And oh yeah, that game oh, shit. On the that Wii. is a, yeah, yeah. Technically, that is a mess. <laughs> Nintendo, it's it's only in recent. We're, we're now circling back to the Unreal Engine uh, stuff again. But this is this is what people love. It's only very recently that Unreal Engine stuff has now started to run decently on Nintendo consoles. But literally, only the two fucking games that Nintendo made in Unreal Engine Four run any decently on Switch, which is Yoshi's Crafted World and Pikmin Four. The Arkham Collection that they did for Switch, which is UE. Well, yeah, no, you said um, they're the UE3 versions, aren't they? Apart from Night, which is UE4. Yeah, so Arkham Asylum and Arkham City, um, from all of the footage and all of the reviews, those look to be the Unreal Engine 3 originals, rather than the Unreal Engine 4 Return to Arkham. Yeah, Yeah. Um, and those have very different looks and aesthetics and lighting treatments and such. It's very easy to, from the visual mood alone, spot the original versus Return to Arkham. Uh, Night was only ever Unreal Engine 4, yeah, but it's... Even the Unreal Engine 3 stuff, it, like, it's fine, I guess, but it's still not where it should be. No, and a lot of UE4 stuff doesn't scale super well to the Switch, which, mm. again, I think was partially a thing of why they made Pikmin 4, just to be like, is this any viable on the console? Which it is, but you... But basically, it means that you can't scale games down to it. You have to, like, make games. If you're making an Unreal Engine 4 game, it still has to be built around the Switch's, like, specs, basically. I know I know. Doom 2016 and The Witcher 3 got highlighted for how well they translated to the Switch, but <laughs> I don't know what engines they were built in, and I don't know what kind of effort was required. So Doom was id Tech. It's their own internal stuff, and, yeah, like... Seems to be pretty scalable for the most part, which is why a lot of Bethesda stuff uses that now. Hmm. Um, which I think was their own in-house engine as well. And I think, yeah, they just wanted the effort of like rebuilding that for the Switch. So They did it properly, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, have you got any other thoughts about 007? Because we've gone through, we talked about the game, we talked about how it looked, we talked about hmm. how it sounded, we talked about the controls, we talked about stealth and gadgets and shooting we talked about the films we talked about the different levels we even talked about the multiplayer in the dlc i'm trying to think if there's anything that we have missed out but no i think that's pretty comprehensive i would say um i guess sort of like my my final thought on 007 legends would be i'm glad i got around to it yeah It it was interesting at least and it's it's sort of one less game on a backlog that is far too big that's true I'd be interested to see, because I've only played some of GoldenEye Reloaded, um, hmm. and obviously the same engine and all the rest of it, but that's taking the same idea and doing one film rather than five, so I'd be interested to see if the execution is better there, um, because I've got that, you know, the time to actually tell a story instead of just five climaxes with no build-up. The thing I would say Reloaded has going for it is, one, it had full development time. I would say mm. that this game probably would have been better if it was a little bit longer in the other. Like, as much as I'm complaining about, oh, this driving section kind of sucks and, oh, this section's kind of poor, it's mostly just down to not so much execution, but just sort of, like, the the, the small <laughs> details, like how the controls feel and, like, you know, how the areas look and how the enemies react and whatever which seems like it's mostly down to trying to retrofit a double A Wii engine into a triple A PS3 and 360 game, which was never really going to work, especially in the timeline that they had. No, Whereas, but if you're going to play a version of it, you may as well. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, that was my story about um, GoldenEye Reloaded, or the Wii version of GoldenEye, which was that initially the plan was, because this was around the time, going all the way back to the convo that we were having at the beginning of the episode, where... 
now that GoldenEye is out on Switch Online and uh, Xbox Series X through Rare Replay, when the Wii was originally announced and they were going to put N64 games on it, one of the things that Reggie said was, yeah, we're talking to Microsoft to see if we can get Rare games on there. And the big one that we want to try and get on the Wii is GoldenEye. But the problem is, is that we have to coordinate with Microsoft, who own Rare, and Activision, who own the Bond license. To the extent of, apparently, Rare had a playable prototype of a 360 version of GoldenEye working pretty decently that they had made in-house. But yeah, Activision- it got the perfect dark treatment, and that that actually leaked, and I have played yeah. it on the Xenia emulator, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. That got leaked yeah. a couple of... Um, I want to say it got leaked the year before they finally announced the Switch Online and uh, uh, Rare Replay version. But the thing that's interesting with that is that they did that internally, and the thing that put the kibosh on that was Nintendo saying, don't do that, and Activision being like, we have the license. Uh, Free MGM, Radical... were they in the mix as well? Sorry. What's that? Um, MGM. Obviously. Oh, yeah, MGM yeah. were also, they were very, yeah, kind of weirdly protective about it as well, so they put the kibosh on it. Free Radical Design, the people who made the original GoldenEye and then Tide Splitters, before they went into administration, mm. went to Activision and said, look, we saw what Reggie was saying about like GoldenEye on the Wii and whatever, but like, why don't we just co- why don't we go to the simplest thing, which is you own the license in Activision. We could just remake it for you for the like whatever console you want. Like we got a pitch. We could do this for triple. Like we made like sure Hayes was a disaster, but that's because we didn't have enough time to get it on the thing. But we could make triple A golden eye for you. Are you interested? And Activision went, yeah, don't give a shit. So they went. Um, they went into administration. A year later, Activision goes to Eurocom and say, "Hey, could we commission you to make a golden eye game?" Oh, for fuck's sake! So. What do you think was the thing, like, was it just because of the fact that Eurocom was probably, like, I mean, I don't know how, I think it was also a thing of just, like, well, we game's going to be cheaper. Mm. But also just, like, did, what? because I, I can't imagine Free Radical were asking for that much. I mean, it would have been enough money to save them from administration, but, like, I can't imagine been Eurocom, done reasonably. No, I can't imagine yeah. Eurocom working tighter, like, deadlines and budgets than Free Radical ever did. So. It certainly didn't get the quality you'd have gotten out of Free Radical either. One, well, absolutely not, no. Or even just like that kind of level of... I mean, because Eurocom can make great Bond games, but they couldn't make GoldenEye. Like, I they, wonder if... Because you mentioned it was the same year as Bloodstone, and I wonder if it was... Uh, I have a reputation for talking in Sonic analogies, but... Sure. Sonic 06, they originally wanted a Wii version of Sonic 06, and obviously oh, that yes. wasn't going to be possible. So they split Sonic Team in half and said, right, you guys continue on Sonic 06. You guys, we need a fucking Sonic game for the Wii. We don't really care what it is. And that's how we got Secret Rings. So I wonder if huh. it was a similar thing of, we can't put Bloodstone on the Wii. What else can we do? Fuck it, we've got Eurocom sitting around with their fingers up their butts. Let's give them a job. Yeah. Yeah. And hey, we've still got this golden eye idea in our heads because Free Radical gave it to us, but like we're not going to put that team together. Because, well, they couldn't at that point because they were bought out by uh, Crytek. So, mm. so yeah, they probably just went to Eurocom and said, "Hey, you're a firm hand when it comes to Bond stuff. Why don't you take a crack at it?" And there we go. And I was saying, in regards to Legends, yeah, they are a firm hand. Like this game isn't like a massive disaster. It's just not very. I don't know. Doesn't get the bug plump. Pump, uh, doesn't get the blood pumping i guess it's just not very exceptional you know? so, Which, I, I like the first take of that it doesn't get the butt plug <laughs> it doesn't get the boat plug in no absolutely not um so again like we could like dream about a version of this game that had another two years of development time which could have been mm. like fantastic or even like a wee version of it which may have been a bit tighter and cut down or whatever but like i mean it is what it is it is yeah oh shit, we're going to lose the license soon. Oh shit, there's not really a new Bond movie to tie into. Fuck, what else can we do to Tony Hawk's this and get a quick buck before the license yeah. dies? Um, and they're like, well, we'll pass it off as a celebration. And it's not, it's a cheap cash-in. But no. I've. it's also kind of inoffensive, considering the circumstances. Yeah. 
actually what came out of it is surprisingly competent. Yeah, no, I think yeah. it's so, like th- this is the if you looked up solid in the de- dictionary, there would be a copy of 007 Legends next to it. I think. Um, yeah, it's fine. Like, I, again, it, it's hard to hate it, but it's also you can see a better game somewhere in there, which it's partially because you play Go and I Reload and you go, oh, this is a better game. But also, mm. I think Go and I Reloaded also can't, sort of benefit from having a Wii control scheme, which this doesn't. Despite the fact that GoldenEye Reloaded, the PS3 version of that, does support the move. Legends does not support the move. Huh. Yeah. I wonder if that's looking at the statistics of how many people actually used the oh, move integration. Yeah, I, I think that is that, yeah, because I think they, the move was something that they slapped together very quickly, which is why it uses the eye toy. But, uh, mm. yeah, by 2012, I think that the interest in that was completely gone which is a shame because that because fucking microsoft went all in on connect like from 2012 into 2013 so i think this is a perfect game for either like a pasta pad session or when you're just hanging out with a mate like, i think what made mm. it, it entertaining and enjoyable was although my wife did not like the game having she her was actually it. yeah she was she was engaged she was talking shit about it <laughs> you know and that that kind of made it a fun experience was just that that hanging out and it's sort of because it's a bit autopilot in a lot of places yeah. um and when it is going wrong um you have that reassurance that it is the game not you because there's someone else going what the fuck is this <laughs> yeah. yeah god yeah i haven't i haven't got much to it i mean I'll, I'll quickly cap it off by just going through a little bit about like what happened after double seven legends so mm. comes out uh critically panned um this is sitting at a 45 percent on metacritic which that seems a bit low yeah i was gonna say you're probably aiming this at what a six out of ten i would say i'm a bit more to a f- i'm i'm an i'm an i'm an edge five out of ten as in this sits in the middle of like games wise but on, on a scale of 100 uh to give it a, a relatively arbitrary number yeah probably about a 65 yeah, 65, I think, was where I was thinking you would probably... Say, like, but yeah, this is a IGN 6.5, mm. which, well... I didn't. I couldn't find IGN score for this, but... Um, so well, I didn't break into my house on Christmas Eve, burn down the tree and piss on the kids, so... No. Well, some people would say it did. So, Official <laughs> Xbox Magazine said, Multiplayer is where the real action is. Here are strips of its stealthy presentations. 007 Legends is finally free to focus on the mindless but consistently enjoyable Twitch action it does best. Which, yeah, when it's doing shooting, it's pretty solid. You know, the AI isn't the most smart, but, you know, when you're in multiplayer, that's not so much a problem. Games Radar said, Bond's latest shooter is barely kept afloat through the five-hour-long campaign, but while it has smatterings of good ideas, the buried beneath concept so tired, you'll have a hard time caring. Hard to, hard to argue with that, I guess, but also the, the amount of variety in this game I did think was... Well, it's just something you don't really get in FPS games anymore, so... Um, what, what I would give it is variety, because through doing the, the five films, I think there was a trend that's still lingering now where, like, PS1, PS2 eras, you would go on worldwide adventures where you look at, you know, Tomb Raider, just because I'm in that mindset with the remaster having come out recently. You went to Peru, Greece, Egypt and Atlantis all in one adventure. Um, And then we get to, you compare that to the 2013 Tomb Raider, and it is entirely set on the island of Yamatai. Yeah. Right? And that was the trend around then. You just had this one environment for an entire game because it's cheaper to create assets for one place, (laughs) and it got old real fast. Whereas 007 Legends uh, went for it, despite the short time and and the low budget, you know, we are jumping eras in time. We're jumping around the world. We're going off planet at one point. Yes. And you kind of, that keeps it far fresher than it otherwise would be. And just in regards to variety of gameplay, it's like even in the shooting, you have turret sections and like night vision sections, which are in- mm. and sniping, which is interesting. But then you have bits of driving, you have bits of stealth. Granted, didn't like the driving, didn't particularly like the stealth, but, you know, still a different flavour to sort of engage with. The stealth had me screaming, who the fuck saw me? And I was reloading (laughs) a save, doing exactly the thing I did last time, but this time I didn't get caught. No. 
Uh, Giant Bomb said, The idea of an anthology like tribute to Bond films of the past isn't a bad one, but 007 Legends wastes whatever potential for fun there might have been. Instead, all Bond fans are left with is a heavily rewritten Cliff Notes version of some great and not so great films. I mean, accurate. Yeah, um, not not hard to disagree with that one. And then finally, the meanest review that I saw was from Games Master UK, who said, One of the weakest, most boring Bond games of all time. The brand deserves much better. I'm sure there's a worse Bond game. I'm sure, yeah, no. I, yeah. I, but the problem is, is that I wouldn't want to go looking for it. That's the thing, but... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure tomorrow don't, never Don't dies. lie to me. There's a part of you that's like, I want to find the crustiest it, it, Bond yeah. game. The Game Boy game isn't brill, but I don't know. Isn't that uh, the, the Zelda-like that a lot of people seem to retroactively praise now? Literally only because Nintendo published it. Uh, but uh, as a game, it's okay, is what I will uh, say. Um, for people who don't who can't see us on webcam which they won't be able to use this as an audio on the podcast. I did big air quotes on my fingers at that point. Um, because this game received so much criticism, though, Eurocom uh, laid off 100 employees to try and uh, make up for, well, money that Activision didn't pay them. And because, yeah, the license went kaput a year later, it's no longer available to digitally buy. You would have to get a physical version of this. So... Pretty sad end to Bond games. Up until, obviously, IO Interactive's game comes out, but I think that's going to be a very different kind of Bond game to what I would say is kind of the end of this Bond era, the Brosnan FPS era of Bonds, which sometimes became third-person shooters with EA ones, but for the most part, was Bond with a gun. And some of those games were very good, as is was the case with Goldeneye and Nightfire. Some of them, yeah kind of ended up a bit like 007 Legends, which... I'd say a lot of them were more passable than people give them credit for. Uh, yeah. So, I, certainly so went out with a whimper rather than a bang, but... if I, I think when people have their hypothetical PS2 collections, it's not always... Because I think everybody always goes, oh, you just have the 10 best games on the PS2. You have GTA 3, you have San Andreas, you have MGS3, you have uh, Devil May Cry, blah, blah, blah. But most people never like had PS3 two collections which had all of that stuff. For the most part, it was you'd have like maybe three of those, but then you'd have like single A heaters or double A heaters like um, Star Wars Battlefront, um, Saboteur. Well, that was I guess more of a 360 game. Um, Mercenaries, the first game of that, I think is like a good example of like one of those games that just everybody kind of had. Um, Red and Faction, I think, which we covered Red Faction, on the previous, we did yeah. on the pod, yeah, um, and then like stuff like this, like a lot of license, like the um, Lord of the Rings games. I think people have a lot of fondness for. And that oh, kind Two of Towers way. was great, yeah. Licensed but, games, the kind of punch. If if you veered a little bit younger, you had stuff like the SpongeBob games, which were pretty decent. Like, you know, 3D a surprising platforms. number of people I grew up with had the uh, the Crazy Taxi port. Oh, um, yeah, Simpsons Road Rage, but also Simpsons Hit and Run, I think, is also like a game that people think like pretty fondly of as a licensed game. No, I mean, as in the, an actual crazy taxi port. Oh, funny. Yeah, no. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I guess that makes sense because that's like a, just a solid little arcade game. But I think Bond just kind of fits into all of that of just like, yeah, very, very solid um, mm. licensed game, which... Legends, for the most... I mean, I guess at this point, though, we were just sort of in the Euro 360 stuff where if it wasn't as good as Call of Duty, why would I not play Call of Duty? Which is where kind of a lot of licensed stuff like this kind of went to die, which is a shame. We, we say that. I had a lot of top-tier, top-shelf 2D beat-em-ups and fighting games, right? That's true, and you, yeah. You know, you got your... And Street Fighter was just like, have every anthology under the sun. You can play literally any Street Fighter you want. And yet me and my mates were still like, Budokai 3? Yeah, Dragon Ball Budokai 3. Every oh, time. <laughs> and uh, Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm as well is kind of on that. Yeah, a lot of decent anime adaptation fighting games of that. Which again, you mentioned Azura's Wrath earlier. That's where that kind of comes out of. It's all those kind of Cyber Connect 2 games. But I guess just stuff like Bond though was just, I don't know, kind of was starting to become a bit left in the past, which was sort of why Daniel Craig's Bond existed in the first place, to bring him up to date. So. And 
I think a lot a lot of people had like you'd go over to a mate's house and they probably had either night fire or agent under fire. Rarely oh, yeah. did they have both, but no. usually one of the two was on their shelf. You never saw everything or nothing, though. Uh, that was a decent no. rental game, but I never saw anybody who actually owned that game. So. See, I've only recently bought everything or nothing, and that will be my first run time through that one. There we go. Interesting game, is all I'll say. I, I did replay it not too long ago, and yeah, it's it's got stuff to it, is all I will say. I'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of finding stuff out, uh, let's bring this podcast to an end with uh, Sam. It will be your first time doing the bullet time quiz. You did do a quiz a little bit like this when we did a Discord quiz not too long ago, but this is you finally doing an official bullet time quiz. Oh, so, cripes. <laughs> I know. Uh, I'm going to give you 10 uh, different games to try and guess. So this would have qualified for the charts the week of October 20th. Um, so according to VG Charts is where I pulled this one. Mostly leans on the American side, but that shouldn't matter. Actually, no, this is worldwide, so this factored quite a few different things. Now, before we start, do you want to take a guess of where 007 Legends may have came in on the charts? Um, I would be amazed if it charted. Uh, certainly not in the top 10. It's Maybe. definitely not in the top 10. Uh, so sales figures for release month i don't know maybe somewhere in the 80s interesting uh split the difference on that because this debuted at number 50 in the charts number 50 okay. it came in at a strong number 50 in a pretty strong week and a pretty strong month of games which we're now about to get into because starting with number one on the charts it is in its 18th week and despite this being 2012 it is a Nintendo DS game. A Nintendo DS game that just kept selling. Um, it's probably going to be either Mario Kart DS or New Super Mario Bros. It is neither of the Mario games. Oh, say. Jesus. Okay, charting weeks on the is... DS for 18 yeah. weeks. Pokemon Black? It is Pokemon Black, but which one? Ah, oh, because there's fucking two, isn't there? Um, yeah. So, Lishy, you're flipping a coin on this one. I um, I fell off these ones as well because they gave me a bloody Pokemon game where one of the Pokemon was a bin bag with Google eyes on it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go one. Unfortunately, it is Pokemon Black and Pokemon White 2 for the Nintendo ah. DS. <sighs> yep, they, weren't, they hadn't quite made it over to the 3DS yet, which, fair enough, they'll do it with X and Y in, I want to say, 2013 and 2014. But no, these Black and White 2 were uh, top sellers for the console, which makes sense. Uh, but number two, in its fourth week, isn't a DS game. It's a PS3 and a 360 game, and it is a sports game. Oh, Okay. And this is worldwide, so probably not FIFA, but Madden, they go a year ahead. So Madden 13? It's not Madden 13, so it's the other one. Oh, FIFA 13. So it is FIFA Football 2013. Okay. Yep. Uh, so at number three in the charts in its third week is a Wii game. Um, and I will give you this clue. It's not a Nintendo game, but it is a game that was... Basically, it, it made its bread on the Wii. And they released a game on the Wii like every year in this franchise. Oh, a franchise. Christ, when you were saying like Wii made its bread there, not Nintendo, I was like, oh, Mad World or something. Oh. Um, a franchise on the Wii. Think, oh, think it'll way, be a Just way, Dance game. Uh, yeah, it is Just Dance, but which one? Three? close enough it's just dance four yeah. oh all right yeah. is Thanks this so. a point where because there was a, a point where they stopped making just dance games for the wii u but kept releasing them on the wii mm-hmm. yeah people still owned wii's and they were still i want to say that like there were just dance games coming out on the switch what which and they were still coming out on the wii which is shocking it's just amazing that they started skipping the wii u in favor yeah. of the wii it was, it was the best seller Makes sense. Uh, let's get into some more interesting games, though, because number four on the charts in its second week is a PS3, 360, and PC game from Bethesda. They published it. Oh, Bethesda published. Okay, so we're not yes. talking Skyrim. 
Um, what have they published? They've published. It's too early for Doom. Yes, um, Doom was twenty sixteen. Yeah, so four years too early for Doom. Okay. This um, is. Oh, sorry, was there a, was there a Wolfenstein out around then? No, so Wolfenstein New Order was 2014, and the other yeah. Wolfenstein was 2009, so a little bit before this. I'll give you a clue. It's the first game in a kind of franchise. It got another. It got a sequel game and a bunch of spin-offs. It's also the first game from a studio which is still with us, I would say, but are a big part of the Bethesda family. Uh... What else is Bethesda? Yeah, it, they farmed out New Vegas to to different developers. To Obsidian. Obsidian so. It is not a. It is not a Fallout game. Okay. Now I'm gazumped. Okay, I will give you some more clues then. Uh, this game is a spiritual successor of sorts to stealth games like Thief. Okay, so Deus Ex was published by Square Enix. That's right. So that's that's out. Uh, 2000, 2012, October, Bethesda. I guess this would have been in this... Yeah, no, this would have been the beginning of October because this came out two weeks ago. Right. Who was Bulletstorm by? Bulletstorm was people... obscure to be number five. <laughs> okay. No, Bulletstorm was People Could Fly in, which was published by Epic, I want to say. And that was 25th, and that might be in 2012, so. I'm grasping at straws, are you going to have to put me out of my misery? Are you, are you don't want to, I, I, I was going to say, I could give you, I can give you the developer, which hopefully should give it away. Oh, okay, who, who developed it? Arcane. Oh, Dishonored. It is Dishonored, the first Dishonored game. And, it's second and I still have not finished it. <laughs> oh, it's a great game. And this is, that's kind of what I meant in regards to like, because, yeah, Bethesda at that point was known for, like, Skyrim and, I guess, Fallout. But this was that weird period where they bought Arcane and that sort of became, like, the sort of secondary identity was, like, the Arcane stuff and then the Doom stuff. And, yeah, Arcane's still making games for them. Funnily a enough, couple, couple of years ago, I managed to get physical PS4 copies of Dishonored 1, 2, and Death of the Outsider. Oh, nice. Like a fiver at a car boot. Ah, oh, that's And great. they've just sort of... They've gone on the shelf with the best of intentions of, I know these are meant to be great, and I got the whole thing for cheap, and I will get around to them. And then I've just not done it. <laughs> I, I um, Dishonored isn't the longest game in the world. Two is a little bit lengthier, but it's hmm. pretty good. Um, Arcane's a really interesting developer as well, because, yeah, I would say, like, for... It wasn't their first game, but, like, for their first, like, big AAA game, like, Dishonored, like, holds up really well. And so their run of Dishonored 1, Dishonored 2, and Prey are, like, pretty much unbeatable. But then everything they've kind of made since has been, had weird compromises to it to the extent of an Death upcoming Luke. episode. Yeah, De- definitely, which was, like, my favorite game of that year, but also, like, I can understand, oh, this was compromised to kind of reach a larger audience. To the extent of an upcoming episode that we're doing a bullet time is on Redfall, a game that... Ah they made last year and it's not great and we're gonna get into why left for dead with vampires by arcane it it should have worked (laughs) it should have worked but then they also decided hey why don't we try and make our own far cry game it's like that's not the worst idea but it's also live service well that's a really bad idea don't do that speaking of games which are controversial and it's number five in its third week is a ps3 and a 360 game published by capcom 2012 Capcom in at number five. Um, just for the irony of the numbers matching up, Street Fighter Five. Oh no, it is not Street Fighter Five. I believe that's two years away. Okay. Fourteen. This is a game I don't like, and I would say most people don't like this game. But you do find those rare people who say, actually, this is the best game that Capcom ever made. Resident Evil 6? It is Resident Evil 6 in in its third week. I mean, yeah. for something everyone hates, that's that's decent sales, number five. 
Oh, well, I mean, Resident Evil games still sold like fucking gangbusters. Uh, that's the funny thing is that people always say like, oh, well, six was the dip in the series, which is why they had to make seven. No, six was like, four was the best sound in the series. Then five was the best sound in the series. Then six is the best sound in the series. And then seven's been the best sound in the series, followed by two remake, followed by eight, followed by four remake. Basically, like, that needle has only ever moved up, except uh, for Resident it, Evil three remake. Yeah, except for the free. Yeah, room. yeah, but we don't, we don't no, talk about, we don't talk about that. That's, no, it's like the cousin you don't invite to your wedding, you know. Much like the original Resident Evil Three was for the PS One. It's not good. A different show, different time. I think we could we could talk about Resi Three all day. Oh yeah, no, we'll, yeah. we'll save that for the um, Operation Raccoon City episode or something. I don't know. Number six on the charts, though, in its third week for the PS Three and the Three Hundred and Sixty, is another sports game. But I'm going to give you a clue. It's not Madden. And it can't be FIFA because we already had it. Um, NBA 2K13? It is NBA 2K13 from 2K Games. In at number six. Pretty good. Nice. Uh, it's neither of the footballs. It doesn't leave much. <laughs> no, very cheap. Now, number seven in the charts is in its 13th week. It is a Nintendo 3DS game, and it has sold 2.7 million copies. Uh, was there ever a point that Mario Kart 7 wasn't charting in the top 10? Uh, apparently this one, because it is not Mario Kart 7. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is it Nintendo? It is. Yeah, it is very much. An, it is the most Nintendo game you could think of. Oh, okay, so uh, New Super Mario Bros. 2? It is New Super Mario Bros. 2 for the Nintendo 3DS. And yeah. Which is another seven. one people rag on all the time, but that's the sales state of people. Hmm. It, it's, I think people rag on it just because it's like, oh, we're doing another New Super Mario Bros. game. Uh, they sell very well. And from what I understand, the second one, pretty good. Hmm. A fine game. A game that a lot of people don't say is fine, but because at number eight this week, it is new this week, if you can believe such a thing. Okay. It is another PS3 360 game. It is another Bethesda published game as well. I'm having I'll trouble this... believing some of these are 12 years old. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm going to say this as well. This isn't a 12 year old game. This is a re release of a game that came out in 2003. Oh, shit. Okay. So oh, not oh it might came out in 2000. Game. We're talking about a 21 year old game. <laughs> it may have came out in 03 or 04. I can't remember. It might even came out in 05. Were we already in the era of remasters then? Jesus. Oh, yeah. No, and this was a pretty big remaster as well. Okay, a big remaster of a 2003 game that released in 2012. 03, 04, 05. I genuinely can't remember wh- what the exact one of those game. years. It came out in one of those. It came out around the time of Half Life 2, is what I will say. Bethesda. It's not going to be de- Bethesda developed, it'll be Bethesda published. Bingo. Okay. A studio that Bethesda recently, at the time that we're talking about in 2012, a studio that Bethesda had recently acquired from Activision, funnily enough. Do they have Quake now? You're on the right lines with Quake. Did they re-release Unreal Tournament? No, Unreal Tournament is epic. Think yeah. it. Think it. Oh, along the right lines with Quake. Yeah. Oh, is this when they brought out the, uh, the update of Doom 3? Do you remember what the subtitle is? Uh, BFG Edition? Number eight this week, Doom Free BFG edition for the PS3 and the 360. My favorite as well. Um, partially the reason that they put BFG edition out was because uh, Carmack was demoing it with the original um, prototype versions of the Oculus Rift. He oh, was nice. like, hey, we can get this working with VR. And that was meant to be a selling point of the BFG edition, which never happened, weirdly enough. I'm sure I have. I've got a PSVR Doom game on the show. Uh, yeah, that will be Doom 2016 VFR edition. Yeah, I've got Doom VFR edition. Um, mm-hmm. I could have sworn I had a Doom 3 VR up there as well. 
you may it may have come out for some reason i thought it never oh you know what? i might be getting it confused with alien isolation which they demoed that in vr but that never came out in vr yeah because i'm sure the selling point of either doom vfr or doom 3 vr was that it supported the um the bigger gun that came with farpoint and i'm pretty sure i bought it just because I need more excuses to justify <laughs> to use that power. thing's continued existence in my house. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's VFR edition because the viewpoint gun was, uh, or the far point gun was, uh, it was a PS4 gun, right? Uh, the far point gun was, yeah, it's a PS4 gun. Yeah. It's got the two handles, but I'm sure. I'm going to have a quick look. <laughs> yeah. No, that's absolutely fine. I'll try and uh, filibuster with any Doom 3 BFG edition yeah. points. Doom 3 with... VR edition, PlayStation VR games. Oh, there we go. Might yeah. have been digitally... Oh, no, if you have a physical edition, it must be. It must have came out. God. Yeah, yeah, I've got both of them on my shelf, I'm sure. There we go. Um, Doom 3, okay <laughs> game, is what I will say. Uh, people have asked if we'll do it on bullet time. I don't... I don't know. I don't think we will. I don't think it's... I don't think it quite misses the mark enough uh, like when you sort of look into the development history of it. It is an interesting it be, game. It'd be interesting to see because there was the original like Xbox version which was more horror-y and, and a lot darker and mm-hmm. you could only have the flashlight out or the gun, not both. And then there's the BFG edition where like, no, just the flashlight is like on your chest at all times and it's uh, a bit more action-y and it, it changes the tone. Quite yeah, the dynamics yeah. change quite a bit, which sort of goes against, like, it kind of breaks the design of the game, which I know a lot of people didn't like that design, but it was functional, like, when it worked to a particular thing. So it's that's how it's like, do you prefer the artist's intent, or do you sort of prefer what you would rather, I suppose, but, eh. uh, yeah. Yeah. Number nine, which is also new this week on the charts, this is a Wii game funnily enough despite the fact that the wii u i think is out in 2012 this is a wii game and it's doing incredibly well it's an activision published game oh they were still putting out like bad compromised ports of call of duties weren't they they were but i will give you i will help you out this isn't a call of duty game this is a a, this is a franchise and I want to say a gimmick, which no longer exists, but it was the hottest thing for about three years between, I want to say, 2010 and 2013. A franchise and a gimmick for a few years. Which is hard because Activision were the king of gimmicks. They had yeah. Rock Band with a guitar controller. They had Tony Horse with a stupid rock and roller controller. And this was a similar thing, although this was The Udraw more- tablet was Ubisoft, so that's a complete... Mm-hmm. It's wrong area entirely. Um, hmm, what are they putting out? Like, no, SingStar was a PlayStation property. That's not going to be it. Mm-hmm. Gimmicky Activision Wii. I'll get you clear. It's a franchise, which is a sequel franchise to a long-running platformer franchise. Which Activision owned at that point. Activision owned a platformer? Okay. Well, technically they owned two that they managed to get out of the Universal uh, Vivendi deal. Oh, so this is going to be like Crash of the Titans or something. Not Crash of the Titans, no. Mind Over Mutant? Not Mind Over Mutant, no. It's not Crash. Okay, so... Ah, oh, what were they called? It was Legend of Spyro... Mm-hmm. Something. Then it was The Eternal Knight. Mm-hmm. And then it's the one where he's got the female dragon with him. Um, yeah. And then what happened after that? Oh, fucking Skylanders. It is Skylanders, but which one? <laughs> it's <all> of... <laughs> uh, Spyro's Adventure? <laughs> No, so I, like, Spyro, Skylander Skyro Adventure, I think, is the first one. This is a late... Because they were pumping these out as quick as they could while it was still Yeah, I've been through most of them in co-op with Grayson on the PS3. So it was Spyro's Adventure, then it was Giants, then it was Swap Force, then we had that horrible car racing one. Um, so you've said it, but 
I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna throw the question. Which one do you think it is uh, of those that you just listed? Giants. New this week is Skylanders Giants for the Wii. Okay. By Activision and <laughs> Toys for Bob. Yeah, Toys for Life. Massive deal for about three years and then boom. Gone. And literally a, a mate of mine who owns a game shop gave me a bin bag full of Skylanders to pass on to Grayson because he just, they couldn't even give them away, basically. <laughs> it's a shame because like, at least with Lego Dimensions, it had the element of that, oh, it's just Lego, though. Mm. Like, when you're not doing the Toys of Life stuff, you can just recycle them into Lego. Amiibo is like, oh, shit, these are affordable Nintendo figures. Like, I'm not even going to use these for what the point is. I'm just going <laughs> to... Affordable. Nintendo. Not yeah. when the scalpers get hold of them, they're not. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no. Oh, sorry. Well, 15 quid before scalpers get hold of them. But yeah, like, Nintendo figurines, which were relatively accessible... Mm. And then with the Disney Infinity stuff, it was kind of a thing of like, oh, well, you know, it's cool little Disney action figures. Skylanders, the, they have very cool designs, but like mm. they were so tied to that game that like, I can't imagine what the context would be like if you just had them as action. Like, I don't know. Like, um, I mean, I've got I've got the Crash Bandicoot and Neo Cortex ones up on the yeah. shelf behind me. Um, I went out and bought its Imaginators that they're in. Uh, I went out and bought Imaginators specifically to Crash Bandicoot pack. Mm. Um, and that was, I mean, me and Grayson were burned out from playing them but at that point. But mm. I was like, uh, we were so starved for new Crash Bandicoot content. And he didn't have the tribal tattoos. So I was like, I'm buying it. I'm getting it. Yeah. And to be honest, the Crash redesign in um, Skylanders is quite nice. Like, I think oh, it yeah. looks better than the, than the fucking insane trilogy design that they went with. It was still stylized, but faithful to the original, and it's, it's a damn good figure. Oh yeah, no, the, and the Neo Cortex one, I it, like looks spot on. So mm. like, like that's the funny thing with Cortex is that they've never really crashed. They've kept like tweak, changing the design variables to be like, oh, should it be fluffier? Should it be smoother? Should it be cute mm. sort of stuff? Neo Cortex, I think, like they put they up the poly count, and then they've never changed the design since because they just like got it, you know. Uh, certainly twin sanity he had more of a a cartoony mad doctor vibe where they they made him a bit slimmer a bit taller he had the big black circles around his eyes that's true yeah Yeah, whereas yeah i was gonna say whereas in uh, crash 4 he's kind of they kind of they're still dark but it's kind of more like an orange he just has very thick eyelids from what i remember Mm. but man anyways let's bring it home number 10 and it's fifth week. It's a PS3 and Xbox 360 game. Okay. Published by 2K Games. One of their big franchises. Uh, what don't they own? That's the question. Uh, I will help you narrow three. it down as well. It is a FPS game. Yeah, it didn't help as much as you were hoping. Uh, <laughs> okay, it is an FPS. I will, I will, and then I will make it a little bit easier. It's an FPS hybrid. It's an FPS combined with something else. Okay, two K games, FPS, twenty twelve. Well, it's not 007 Legends. Uh, <laughs> no, funnily <laughs> enough, it's not because that was that was published by Activision. So. And came in at number fifty. <laughs> Yeah, and that came in at number 50. No, this is a game that was more popular than 007 Legends, even though I think it shouldn't be, because this is a franchise I am not a fan of, but I'm very much in the minority. Uh, oh, shit. 2K own Bioshock, don't they? They sure do, but this is not Bioshock. Ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> I but, it is it, a, <laughs> but it is a series that begins with B. Another shooter series that begins with Oh, Battlefield. It's not Battlefield. That is owned by EA. Okay, yeah, fair. <laughs> so <like> FPS B. <laughs> um, uh, I'll give some extra help. Uh, developed by Gearbox. Gearbox B. What is the game the Gearbox is most known for? Oh, Borderlands. Awful. Yeah. But which one? 2012 uh, 2 Borderlands 2 fifth week in the charts at number 10 yeah which is far more than it deserved yeah I am not a fan of those Borderlands games and I will give you this fun fact because I said that it was developed by Gearbox Um, we did an episode on Aliens Colonial Marines which came out in 2013 the year after this 
And basically, they were developing the first Borderlands game and Aliens Colonial Marines around the same time. Okay. Put out Borderlands 1, did massively successful, and then said, shit, we need to rush another one out as quickly as possible. Let's take the money that Sega paid us for fucking Aliens Colonial Marines and spend that in-house on Borderlands 2. It's got to be breach of contract or something, surely. No, and the nice and the fun thing is, is that I don't have to say allegedly because they got taken to court about this. Ah. And it was proven <laughs> that that was the case. And so it was okay. breach of contract. <laughs> yeah, no, it was yeah. breach of contract. Um, Alien School of Marines was then farmed out to another developer called Time Gate to basically make that while well, base, well, fucking Gearbox rushed out Borderlands Two as quickly as possible. So my my core experience with the Borderlands games, uh, we've we've tried it twice, um, actually three times. The first mm. time was Borderlands one, and this was, I think we'd finished uni, but we were still living with the same housemates, and it, he'd played it before, so we both went in, and he brought in like a level twenty something character. I'm there at level one. Because he knows where all the objectives and everything are, he just vanishes into the sunset. <laughs> and he I get all these notifications up. like quest completed, quest completed, level up. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing anything, mate. I'm still figuring out what buttons for weapons. <laughs> no, I, I've never like the humans. Whatever is kind of you know, it's it's in the eye of the beholder. Whatever, it's not my kind of thing, but. The gameplay is just like, I've never got on with it. And it was a funny mm. thing, because when I did the Suicide Squad video, somebody, like, I described the game to somebody and they went, well, that just sounds like Borderlands. How's that bad? And I was like, I hate the gameplay of Borderlands, because it is just pretty row FPS missions, but then with, what's the appeal? You get a billion guns with, like, miniature stat differences, and it's like, yeah, I have no interest in that whatsoever. So the one thing that elevated it... Hmm is that uh, I have, obviously, the PlayStation VR, and we talked about the Farpoint controller earlier, and more yeah. excuses to use that controller. Borderlands 2 VR. Um, huh. interesting. Yeah. yeah, that VR did a lot for Borderlands 2, and I still didn't finish it. Interesting. I did not know that I had a VR version. That's neat. Yeah. God. The things you learn on this podcast known as Bullet Time, where we talked about 007 Legends for... Uh, f- nearly three hours and twenty five minutes, so we should probably wrap this up as quickly oh, as Jesus. Yes, yeah, so we got we got to be moving tomorrow. So Sam, um, sorry, thank you so much for coming onto this episode and talking. Oh, no need to apologize. This this has been a blast. Uh, hope you, I hope you had a lovely time talking about uh, Double Seven Legends. Yeah, it's been all right. Yeah, it's been it's been all right. Oh, wouldn't feel better than that. Hopefully, hey, listen, <laughs> thank it's you like for being typical here. British, isn't it? Oh, oh yeah, I know. Uh, hey, while you're here, though, thank you very much. Uh, would you like to plug anything? Is there anything that you want people to have a look at of yours? Um, probably just the most recent video, which is the Batman Arkham City video. Uh, if you search Webster Batman Arkham City, it will hopefully be the top result. Uh, it's oh. just shy of two hours, uh, and up being far longer and far more effort than I thought it would be. Um. But yeah, I, I, I had fun people ranting. Can, people can find you at uh, Webster on YouTube, yeah? Uh, yeah, at Webster on YouTube. I think it's at Webster's YouTube. Now they've done that weird tag thing. Yes. It's definitely at Webster's YouTube on Twitter, uh, which is its name, and it's never been called anything else. Fair enough. Uh, as per usual, I've been James. You follow me over on the website formerly known as Twitter at Hot Cider, H-O-T-C-Y-D-E-R. If you enjoyed this episode, we would love you to leave a review on your podcast app of choice. And hey, if you want to support us, you can do so over on Patreon at Hot Cider as well. And until next time, uh, so Sam, we usually at the end of these episodes, we say keep blasting, but we've now gotten into the trend of saying like, Rather than blasting something related to the game that we talked about, but I can't think of something bond. I guess keep bonding? I don't know. Keep gadgeting? Keep gadgeting? There weren't uh, many gadgets in this one, though. Keep keep being mildly disappointed. <laughs> keep being mildly disappointed. There we go. 
There we go, that's how I win that. <laughs> This podcast has been made possible by Dylan Robinson, Eric Hamilton Schneider, Jesse Garasha, Kevin from Pixelit, Mouse, Twyla27, Valerie B, VG, and the Hot Cider Support tier. If you'd like to help with the production of episodes and gain access to extra content, consider supporting over at patreon.com forward slash hot cider. That's H-O-T-C-Y-D-E-R. A special thanks to Max Coburn for the Bullet Time theme tune.